I know enough. Any other questions from the audience? <laughs> there was a Kubrick reference in this video uh, also, by the way, but then uh, another film by Kubrick. <laughs> I see your hand going up again. So, basically, referring to this kind of frictionless, positive future, which, is, which will be present in eight years, and then simultaneously, strongly referring to kind of dystopia at the same time that would, let's say, at least inspire you to some kind of moment of self-reflection, also taking, taking into account my particular question on this. Who's it going to answer? Now? Yes. So, um, li listening to your question, uh, okay, I am speaking up. Um, so, uh, during our collective project, we did have a lot of discussions about the future and about this kind of um, uh, diversion of labor, let's say, or this kind of uh, um, juxtaposition of the machine and uh, the person. So this, in a way, w um, the design of the supermarket is kind of, uh, on, on the one hand, um, focusing on the consumer experience, but on the other hand, integrating automation. So I could see the link to your question there about this dystopian future that is normally uh, in a way linked to the age of the machines or um, and in our video and in our project of course there are other robots uh, moving around the supermarket and uh, basically taking up the labor in, in the distribution center but on the other hand one of our main uh, let's say propositions uh, for uh, uh, for the supermarket of the future would be that uh, the diversion of labor so People may not work in the distribution center anymore, and it's robots taking care of it. This makes things more efficient, more easy, uh, and the uh, sales floor more flexible at the same time. But uh, human beings are integrated in the uh, in the supermarket uh, in a different way. So they ter take up the role of the host of the concierge, so catering to the consumers and offering this other um, kind of experience. Maybe to clarify uh, uh, upon that, to follow up on that, uh, this supermarket really um, re-envisions the, um, the, the supply chain of where it repositions the, let's say, the anonymous distribution centers, I don't know, in the periphery of our cities and puts that back in the city center, puts it back, uh, well, in the civic uh, area where it is uh, visible to the shoppers really removing that uh, front of house and back of house. There's a question on the front row. Yes, I have a question. Firstly, I immensely enjoyed the film. Um, and it partly because of the soundtrack and the pace of the soundtrack, which I'd like you to address, speed, very much reminded me of a lot of IBM propaganda films about computers, about various other things, in the 1950s, presenting this safe, utopic, uh, future in the background with the Cold War in the background, but the Cold War is not mentioned. And you present a supermarket that is functioning perfectly, bizarrely empty. There's a lot of space, there's a lot of speed, and there's a lot of empty space, which is the opposite of normal, my, my experience of supermarkets, where there's things are slow and things are crammed together. And strangely, uh, kind of hyper-sanitized, and which always backfires, always suggests that there's a kind of dark side, just as the IBM propaganda films in the 1950s, both suggest, in their attempt to conceal, also suggested the dark side of the Cold War. So what is, and then we exit into this gloom, Dutch 
evening gloom. Maybe it's pollution gloom, we don't know. I mean, what, it, what, is, what is under the lid of this film? What is the kind of dark side that it's concealing? So I want you to comment on, to summarize, the speed, space, and the concealed dark side, or maybe there is no dark side in your happy supermarket. Mm, let's see. Let's start with the, maybe the dark side first. I mean, uh, to continue a bit of, on what I was telling before, we really try to eliminate these large-scale distribution centers right now in the periphery um, and cut them up, let's say, and, and um, spread them over, distribute them over the Netherlands um, so that major supermarkets, uh, I think approximately 150 of them in the Netherlands, take upon this role of the distribution center. So it is, let's say, shifting that dark side, which I think, um, well, in a lot of cases, uh, will always be needed to be um, dealt with in a way or another. We put that closer to the shopper. Um, that's the ambition there. Um, help me again. What were the other two points which you wanted to talk about? Please uh, don't or do. Well, yeah, I, I agree, and I think um, part of that dark side is something that exists currently, and then, as you were saying, that we are breaking it up and bringing it into the supermarket that a regular cus customer sees on a daily basis, and thus uh, exposing that, and hopefully through that process, um, people will not be okay with that, and then that will also change by having it present in everyone's kind of daily lives. My question, underlying my question is, despite all the kind of futuristic iconography, despite all the smart technologies, despite all the kind of algorithm-optimized automation, why does it feel like the 1950s? Well, maybe not very directly answering that question, but certain thoughts that we've had while designing the supermarket. Um, so we are still, in a way, disrupting certain um, image or scenography that we have of a traditional supermarket. So we are getting rid of, for example, um, high aisles of the shopping, um, in, inside the shopping um, centers, and we are freeing up the space for the eye level. So it because we are talking about how um, dense the space becomes. This, in a way, opens up the space. And we are also working on existing principles of supermarkets. So considering that the supermarket began as a self-serve store, and now the convenience is coming back through this robot, who's doing almost everything for you, collecting stuff. So there is some allusion to the past, of course. It's not complete, complete disruption, but those existing principles that we thought are forming the base parameters for what a supermarket is or what defines a supermarket are still being integrated within the future. I think, in, in a sense, I understand the pragmatics of your answer. Um, but this is your thesis presentation. So this is the point where you step away from your work. You get critical distance, if you can, maybe you can't yet, and you find a way to talk around it. And I, you know, in a sense, I'm asking you this to, in a sense, culturally cite some of the iconography, some of the aesthetics that you're working with, and, and, and recognize or deny or explain how it resonates with certain iconography that emerged in propaganda films in the 1950s, which is to do with this kind of sunshine world. You know, lots of space. No one's bashing into each other. Everyone is rich. Uh, everyone's healthy. Uh, everything's in supply. Everything's shiny. Everything is convenient. Inconvenience has been eradicated from the planet. Um, and, the, and this incredible, um, in a sense, denial of all the messiness of reality and life. And obviously in the 1950s that served an incredibly important role because that was the lid 
that was used to um, keep Cold War anxiety, both doubly to keep it at bay, but also to kind of use it to kind of secure control over society. So what is, so when I ask about the dark side, I'm not asking about um, uh, the supply, centralizing of supply uh, services. I'm, you know, I'm not talking about dark kitchens and so on. I'm actually talking about psychologically the dark side, culturally the dark side. Under this happy white lid, what is going on in the society that this supermarket is serving? Hello. Um, I think the reason why this is such a happy place um, and we had this discussion is because we are the, the generation that has gone through COVID and we've had this discussion in terms of the supermarket was the only place, um, especially in the Netherlands, for a very long, for the time we were here where you could actually meet. So this is kind of your one safe place where you have the social interaction. And um, we also looked at kind of current supermarkets that are have just been reconstructed and they're purposely putting in these contact moments because of COVID and making the aisles bigger because of COVID. So the supermarkets are already kind of reacting um, towards this kind of interaction and spaciousness of um, what COVID has done mentally for the supermarket because we've all kind of realized um, how f um, while the, it kind of was kind of portrayed, at least by me coming in, that the supermarket was kind of this dying thing. Um, but then when COVID hit, it's this realization that you're very dependent on it Right? It's, it's one of the, uh, the things that had to be open. These are first respond, like it's, it's as important as a first responder. Your, your, your livelihood is depending on the supermarket and it's your only interaction. So I think possibly that's why the attitude of the supermarket kind of progressed in that direction because we kind of view it as, as a generation, as kind of the one meeting place that um, society could, could meet. Um, so it really, it really kind of affected our views on the design. Can I add something? Um, I want to change a little bit the perception of this uh, supermarket. Um, because it's the future, the e-commerce will be more improved. And uh, this Albert Heijn is about 30 in the Netherlands. Albera, sorry. So it's uh, the distribution center. And it's not supermarket as we know. It's not like five of them in a city. It's like uh, one on three or four city round. And uh, we have uh, um, a supply chain th that works within Albera with a small excess uh, supermarkets that are more basic, smaller, and uh, uh, have another, um, functionally another layout. So this one that we, um, see as a, um, a point of arrival of all our projects and uh, as, a, as a main distribution point of the country is a kind of um, uh, place uh, that is um, almost um, for the civic present and the experience of the um, uh, consumer experience that uh, contradict with the e-commerce, let's say, uh, that will be more popular in the future. So that's why um, Albera can afford such an uh, expensive, grocery, beautiful place, because it's not just a supermarket, it's one main point of supply chain that is like 30 in a, city, in a, in a country. And also add, adding up to that, uh, I, I think that let's say the main difference of the supermarket of Albert, of the supermarket of the future, with what we know today, is this integration of the distribution center that Massa was talking about, right? So this, uh, it is kind of envisioning a, a modified uh, distribution network, like a, a new kind of supply supply chain, and functioning within this just-in-time um, production system. So in that way, the the way products are displayed or the way the consumer 
uh, is able to actually uh, get uh, the essentials or not uh, differs and that's what also uh, adds up to the architecture of the supermarket. So this high yield core, this core around which the Albert is organized could differ around every city. So it is this central high yield core with the automated distribution center that makes everything function. It's, it's like a new building type, so it's uh, composed the distribution center and the sales floor because it's operate with the same Akado system that can work both for e-commerce, delivery, and uh, for the sales floor. Can I? Hello. Can you explain how you how you want to structure the afternoon? What are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Besides are we questions. are we getting into detailed questions about the film? There's all this work behind you. Use me. Uh, well, as uh, Solomon was just mentioning, um, this is the our main collective project, which we've worked on together, and it's a design project uh, developed by the 10 of us. So we have this first hour to discuss this new building type, as Marsha just outlined, um, our supermarket, because it's a very novel idea of integrating the distribution center with the supermarket, because that challenges a lot of notions within the entire supply chain and how a supermarket functions. So we would like to spend the first hour discussing what do you think about the design of our future supermarket. Can you just, as a starter, let's say thank you for the beautiful movie, as already mentioned. Um, also, thank you for the very powerful dystopic association provided by you. Could you please then start with the fundamentals? Could you briefly summary, summarize for me what the future supermarket, supermarket contains? What is it? So we've heard it's a different nod in the supply chain. What else? I get my peanut butter there. What else? I will, I will start, maybe someone will help me. So the first thing, as you said, is supply chain. So we uh, understood that uh, the delivery will be more, um, let's say, just in time coming to this um, distribution center. So you don't need uh, a real capacity of the uh, space because you constantly receive something and uh, supply. But I think we need to go into reverse because nobody understands how you even got to the supermarket to begin with of the future. So do I need to remind everybody of how you started this thesis work a year ago? So we, you know, can, can somebody discuss that so that I don't need to do that? I mean, I'm more than happy to do that in three sentences. Okay, so we began as um, understanding the food industry in the Netherlands and beyond. And as Jacqueline was already mentioning that we are a generation who have um, looked at the pandemic situation and how that affects um, building space. And supermarket at, during that duration was the only space or the only meeting place um, which was open and it became an essential part um, during this pandemic which is why supermarket was the building typology we went ahead with as the new civic presence that um, would still um, have, that, like, have that standard of an essential architecture in the future. 
maybe we need to even back up further. So how you began this work was by taking a product from the local grocery store, by tracing the provenance of that product, whatever it was, from gummy bears to portable paella to chocolate bars. It was to then, the logic there and that kind of, just a kind of sketch exercise was to understand then the spatial relationships from a product that was purchased off of a supermarket shelf because we didn't know what the hell we were gonna do, right? We were in a kind of lockdown and we also had to improvise a curriculum, right? So what could we do? Where could you do a research? You start by the one place you can go was the supermarket. Then from there, from your exploration there, which was a really wonderful set of ideas, you all came to particular topics that were real world, that were based on the future, that were based on necessities, scarcity, craft, uh, trade, provenance, uh, sensorialism, taste making, automation, etc. From there, you were uh, given a parameter to develop your own idea, your own contribution, what became a contribution, your own thesis. You were given one parameter, well two. One, it had to be cited within the Blue Banana, which is a historical trade corridor that connects Manchester to Milan, very bluntly, a corridor. Blue, we don't know if it's because it's blue collar or blue because it represents the Euro, but a trade corridor that has also seen a kind of depletion of economic resources and viability. You then, were, so that was parameter one. Parameter two was to cite whatever you were going to do within a 250 meter limit of a piece of infrastructure, which would be um, a canal, a train, et cetera, that would, could eventually go back to the distribution center in Albert Hein, out here in Delft-Sahout, or it's delft Scow, sorry. And then in parallel to this, or a little bit before, you did an analysis of the supermarket of the Albert Hein, putting questions. So there was this kind of linkage between the supermarket as a kind of space and uh, type versus an exploration of the kind of distribution center and how you would have these products or these projects, how they would meet back into, uh, into the distribution center, uh, the local distribution center for Albert Heim, okay? Then, what did you very geniusly decide to do? Exactly, so now can, now is this a bit more clear? Mm -hmm. So now can, now can we start, maybe the, continue the discussion by talking about how you decided to provocatively eliminate the distribution center and combine it with the supermarket. Because that is a clear position. That is about imagining what the future is. So the decision of eliminating the distribution center starts with the idea of that in the future, everything is going to be delivered in small batches in order to ensure uh, freshness. And the just-in-time production uh, responds to the elimination of the, of the distribution center. Then also related to what you were saying about this uh, utopic uh, scenario or utopic uh, scenography, um, one of our positions were really to show the automation, to show the ceiling, and to try to encounter a new relationship between the consumer and the, the machines, uh, even if we also have the host, as Maria was, was saying. Uh, I think that also one of our main positions was to, to show all the, all the production chain in this distribution center to show 
the, the production in, this, in the distribution center, if you have the automa automated ceiling and the consumer can, can see it, uh, it's also so, part of the, we eliminate it, but we bring it to the supermarket. I don't know if I'm missing also another no, reason because they were, were, they were several of them. That for sure, I mean, even the loading dock is a dynamic process, like this ritual of loading and unloading that happens on the sales floor right now. Uh, that we could also see in the video, but you can also see in the drawing set. But, uh, and uh, of course, exposing uh, the distribution uh, network um, upstairs is connected to that. You've eliminated the distribution center, but you're also, there's also production happening in the supermarket. Mm. No, Is no, that sorry. real no. production? No, it's, it's delivery. No, you're not growing anything. You're not milking any cows yes, there. Yes, yes. I want to add about this elimination of um, distribution center and uh, emerge distribution center with the supermarket. It's not, not only about the just uh, in-time production, but also nowadays the dark market emerge. So it's like a small storage within the city to make the delivery quicker. So when you deliver something, it's come in, in the same day, not from the uh, distribution center, but from this dark market. So that um, um, we decided to substantiate, thinking that in the future, this uh, um, kind of uh, delivery will be more efficient than to deliver from the Excel that is uh, um, in the outskirt. And in, and in terms of what kind of activity is happening inside, it's not clear production. Yeah, maybe to add uh, a little bit about the idea of uh, having integrated landscape inside the sales floor. Um, the main uh, focus is about, uh, apart from creating a specific co uh, consumer, uh, consumer experience, um, is also creating a new civic presence, presence by exposing different cultivation methods and uh, diluting, let's say, the opacity of different uh, ideas of, uh, of uh, cultivating from genetically modified to, um, to permaculture. In f and let's say informing the um, consumers about, it has a direct link with the crops itself and what they are consuming through exposing, let's say, these, uh, uh, these landscapes. Hello. Yeah. Maybe I can add something also, because uh, we done this uh, supermarket uh, design also because we have this data that uh, in the future, there will be more delivery to our homes, so the supermarket may be gone if we don't, uh, as an architect also, we didn't do anything about uh, this phenomena. So what is the supermarket in the future is focusing on how, how do you uh, come to supermarket and have this experience to shop in the supermarket is different to shop in your uh, computer. That's why we come to this conclusion of this building. And also that's why uh, when you say there is a, a lot of empty space, because also we with, uh, we propose that empty space is having this uh, value itself. So like shop in shop, like uh, Hermes Chocolate wants to open uh, their booth in the supermarket so uh, people can enjoy their chocolate near the, the garden or uh, to, to add that value to the supermarket itself. So we don't have this conventional supermarket. Uh, so to add to our discussion, there is several uh, real estate um, approaches that we implement in a building. So it's not so utopian, let's say functionally, that is functionally efficient. It's also 
functionally profitable. Maybe someone can say more about uh, real estate expert Ian. Yeah, so it started out with the fact that um, that the supermarket remodels their supermarkets every eight years, and that um, they can sometimes just move and take over an existing building, but that we create a building that is uh, permanently a supermarket that gets um, repurposed and it stays permanently in this location. And that is also part of, um, I guess, uh, contributing to the civic presence, that there is a permanence to the supermarket rather than it being just kind of scenographies that exist um, that can be implemented into any building in a city just because people happen to live there. It becomes a place for people to visit and want to live around. And so the incorporation of the landscape elements that are related to the farming, um, all these amenities that exist, the uh, sculpture or the kindergartens that exist there, they all support the surrounding community beyond just being a source of food or a store for you to get food at. That's now on. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I might, maybe I'm old. I'm struggling with the format of this conversation. I, I've got what I can get from the film. It's great. I love it. Um, I now need to see some drawings. I don't know why you're all sitting in those chairs. Uh, I, you know, let's get into the detail. We're architects here. I need to see how big an area the supermarket can serve. I need to see the dead footprints of the little old-fashioned supermarkets it killed. I need to see where the distribution centers were. You know, I need to kind of understand the dimensions of these aisles that somehow cater for the permanently diseased body. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I need to see its relationship with these. So, you, so you're talking about things, and you're not using drawings, and you're not using space. And I don't know if it's for the cameras and the remote families, but can we just roll up our sleeves and get on with how crits work and what we do. Um, so, do you want to? I don't know, Ilma. Do you want to come over here and they show us these things? I was, I was thinking that maybe we can improvise a little bit and walk around and show you the drawings in the wall that uh, they are uh, quite specific, special, and we can have another kind of debate. Guest. Okay, so the, you're... So this first, first drawing is the drawing of the blue banana, the corridor that Salomon was talking about, where we cited the 10 contributions. So it is also related to the 10 storyboards that you are going to see in this wall and the other wall that are uh, arranged in the order in which we uh, encounter the 10 of the individual contributions. And then the second uh, drawing, the special narrative, maybe some of my colleagues can... Uh, Yes, so the second set of the spatial narratives, it paints the picture of what we've been talking about, basically of what is a supermarket, how does it function, what is the um, back of house or the sales floor for a supermarket, what is the employee's domain or the consumer's domain. Uh, the first board is basically just an analysis of what we've been studying, and the second board um, reflects on that analysis, so that's based on what we are proposing. Um, our design for the future supermarket and how we are um, expressing the concerns that come out from the analysis. So maybe you can observe that in the first uh, plate, all the elements that are uh, highlighted are related to the floor, the floor that we encountered in the traditional supermarket, that, that uh, for us in the second plate, it's now the ceiling, right? Because we start understanding that the uh, uh, automated Ocado grid, now it's part of the new building type. So you can see the uh, contrast between the first plate and the second plate. 
Uh, I don't know if some of my colleagues want to talk about the cutout axonometric, when, where you can understand all the program and the kindergarten, the permaculture, the public uh, uh, space that we were uh, talking about. So you, you, you okay, <laughs> Kinder, so you, 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 you can really, maybe, the, the plan is super clear also to understand. Can I ask a question? Yes. Thank you. Um, no, I was just, I was wondering, no, it's, okay. it's working? Okay, thanks. Um, now, I was wondering, because you expose with your proposal kind of the workings of the supermarket by integrating kind of the distribution and talking about all this, how this works, but then I was thinking, well, where is the landscape in your picture? So kind of where the products are kind of made? How do you imagine this? And this is, let's say, one uh, thing, the landscape itself. And then the second thing is maybe, before we zoom in into one of the supermarkets, maybe the, this question about scale. So you, I think you mentioned at some point that you were talking about 30 supermarkets for the Netherlands. And maybe just a small kind of anecdote. I, I, was, I read on the newspaper that in one village in Holland, they actually had to form a cooperative in order to keep the supermarket in the village because Albert Heijn was leaving the village. Yeah. And maybe this kind of idea of kind of scale of this of yes. your proposal in relation to these kind of questions. Follow us. <laughs> we will... We will go now to the visualized evidence that talks exactly about this. I think that Heng and Michael can introduce a little bit this point of departure in which you start uh, understanding all these numbers, quantities, and uh, relationships with the landscape. Uh, Heng and Michael, can you go through the visualized evidence? So, yep. so um, the idea is that the supermarket is now, with this uh, layout, that it's accessible from all directions and that it um, um, allows for people to cross through it on, um, on their way to different parts of the city. And that... Um, affects the interior, I guess, value of the location of shelves. And um, so this is just within the grid part where it is um, accessible and supplied by the robot system above, directly connected to the distribution system. However, there are um, these shop and shops that are uh, rented out to private businesses that allow for um, other brands to be present because all products outside of those are all bear branded to minimize the number of um, products that has been shown to um, be more um, sustainable uh, for yeah, the like number of SKUs reduced. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, I don't know if this has been clear. So the grid is based off of the robot and it's um, yeah. above yeah. and then it's the 80 uh, pallet grid um, based off of a the palette, but we squared it to make it look like a robot. So also we, we also broke the grid in specific areas to make it more kind of user friendly and more to the human experience. And as Jin was saying, everything is kind of laid out based on taste making, which is one of the contributions that we kind of moved forward with. So instead of knowing kind of vegetables or our group together, they're kind of spread throughout. So maybe you're your lemon is next to your fish, and then it's also next to a specific item because you're you're eating this, and with the consumer is more likely going to buy the lemon with fish. So it's it's reimagining the supermarket and taste making sense with the planograms. And importantly, that the supermarket is reacting to its surrounding and also have bringing the surrounding within the supermarket rather than um, operating as an enclosed. Um, enclosed space, because currently when you walk past a supermarket, uh, the facade is not um, as you would view a more high-end retail space. It is enclosed because everyone kind of understands the supermarket. You just enter and it's organized internally, whereas now the organization of the shelves are um, facing towards the public. Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe I try. You want to say something? Yes, sorry. But uh, I wanted to say that maybe we go to the macro scale first. But what we were, you were asking about, the relationship yeah. with the landscape, the distribution throughout the Netherlands. So maybe Henk can walk us through these maps here. So, 
Yeah, right. So um, we use uh, Alberheim as uh, great. Uh, we took Alberheim as uh, one of the uh, major subjects of uh, this uh, supermarket brand and uh, entity that we started. And this is how the the Alberheim's uh, distribution network look like. So there are two main distribution, like national national wide uh, dis distribution center in the Netherlands, and then in the like. Over the, the the Netherlands, there are like regional distribution center, both uh, regular products and refrigeration products distributed. But then the the problem we um, observe is that uh, s such a concentration is very vulnerable. So, like one very uh, obvious example is that uh, when the COVID first um, outbreak, there was like uh, yeah empty shelves on the supermarket. That is because it is not like uh, everyone trying to buy a lot. Just one customer, based on uh, the research we did, like one customer buy like one or two objects more than he or she usually uh, does. It's already gonna paralyze this thing because everything has to go to the go to these um, centralized distribution center. That is why we propose a more dispersed, distributed. Uh, um, uh, product distribution network. That is why you see all these dots. That's the the, the position of Albert we propose in the Netherlands. You, so you can see the, the the scale and the territory they cover, the difference. And then to explain further on this kind of uh, uh, supply chain, we use this uh, flowchart diagram. So basically, if there is a low inventory in, in our bear, it can, uh, like in one single our bear, it can connect to its local or even a, a global um, supplier. So that is, um, each our bear has more flexibility to, to work with their product. And this is also gives the production system an intimacy. This, is this the radius to the single our bear? No. 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 So, so Albert is here. This is the the old city uh, area of Delft, and Albert is here in uh, Martinez Nehoplan. Yeah. So besides Albert, we also propose this even smaller um, supermarkets or even how? Do, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. Yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. Bending, kind of a bending machine in there. And then a bending machine. Yes. Then hold this. Okay. From our Albera, this is the distribution center in the supermarket. The products are delivered to the small um, Alberches. That is work like. And, and these are all Alberts? Yes. yes. Are there? This is so Alberts. What is the radius of, of service for one Albert? So it. In distance and in, in, distance and in population? Both. So we already. Um, like these are based on, based on uh, the properties our, uh, our hold already have in the Netherlands. And we use so so basically these are some like very big or Excel uh, Albert Heinz existed now, and we try to also add some because they are not actually very evenly distributed in the entire Netherlands. Because for example, like around here and here, it's basically empty. But then, based on like the the demographic, the the population density, we try to um, put more there to support the entire Netherlands. So the collection is based on existing Excel. But so are there, are there less Alberts than there are existing supermarkets? Because you're saying Albert is a more centralized model than existing supermarkets. OK, so Albert is replacing how many? One Albert replaces how many supermarkets? Ma approximately. We, well, and the, we can give Delft as an example. So basically, there's, there's a few major moves you're doing. One is you're incorporating the distribution center. 
Second is you're flipping the significance of the floor to the significance of the ceiling. Thirdly, you're massively centralizing the system. Because you're saying yeah. one of our places. If you compare this student with centralizing within the city, let's say, but but de so obviously, so you're centralizing the, the supermarket within the city, but you're decentralizing distribution within the country. Yes. Okay. And we are missing something very important. We eliminate all the disposable packaging. So we use homogenized Albert packaging. Everything is reusable jars. That that's one of the main answers to the homogenized, standardized, utopic, utopia looking. Okay, it's different, we can come just, back, but... Uh, just have the, this question answered, because I still haven't heard it. So the, you expose the distribution and the shopping, and you combine those two, right? What do you do with the production of the food that is for sale in the supermarket? Is it, so this stays the same as it is today, yes. basically, right? So basically, we, we, know, we know that... Uh, from example, Albert had know uh, who its uh, suppliers from. So uh, we learn also from U.S. There is this supermarkets called Jack Trader Joe's. So every product that comes to Trader Joe's become Trader Joe's uh, brand. So basically, but if you can have uh, agreement with uh, Albert Hand, then your products can be sell a lot more than usual. Then you can have a larger distribution network uh, if you are an, a seller's uh, distribution company. Uh, that's one also. The other thing is uh, because we are making this smaller uh, uh, network, then uh, the supermarket in the city can work with the local produce also, like the, the bakery, the, the milk producer. And so you don't take milk from a uh, bigger company, but you can take milk from uh, local produce. So the, the supermarket itself has a more value to uh, the okay, That, that would be local. interesting to understand this, especially also to understand how this kind of mega conglomerates that now kind of deliver food worldwide, you know, how to kind of understand this production system and the stakeholders that actually have their food in these supermarkets. Well, the, uh, I think that we can understand the production system like in a better way through our, the individual contributions to the supermarket okay. because they focus on production, whereas the supermarket is where everything is condensed and where everything arrives to and how the customer reaches the project. But before that, maybe we can go through the, the drawings set of the supermarket. Also a small reminder, since we want like to stick to the schedule, uh, so it's almost three, so we're, we, we need to wrap the supermarket up. Exactly. We will be super quick. <laughs> but uh, after the blue banana and the storyboards, uh, of course here uh, the axonometrics of the building, and in a way we can see the blurred boundaries between, let's say, the city and uh, the supermarket uh, with the incorporation of the bike lane for uh, fast pace uh, deliveries, uh, any commerce, but also the landscape getting into the building, etc. Um, Somebody mentioned kindergarten, another program. Yes. Can you show where the kindergarten yes. is, other programs are? Kindergarten is over there, but maybe, With your fingers, maybe, maybe we can go to the plan of the sales force to understand what is happening inside. No, we don't try to make an key. So we have a different um, pace inside the supermarket, like a pedestrian slow pace, and also you can go on a bike with a more fast pace. So we have some, because we want to introduce a civic presence, we want some public, let's say, facilities uh, to have inside. That's why here you have this uh, course with the um, host, the kindergarten, some uh, coffee places and uh, shop in the shops that uh, works like a, um, also a real estate prop, uh, uh, approach. So we try to combine um, on the one hand this very efficient system. On the other hand, because it's um, retail, so we try to look on this task also from this point as, as a um, profitable um, Building so the sales floor works like a real estate uh, platform that um, 
you can rent a place and have your own shop inside. Uh, so with this, we can sell this uh, space more um, expensive because it has some uh, other facilities around. So this just a position of different things make pro place more profitable. So with the uh, green areas, we have, for example, winery. Uh, with uh, uh, shrimp pond, we have uh, more exclusive shops. So it's just a, just a post things to sell these square meters. What's what's the cultural program? What what you, you mentioned a cultural program. Cultural program? No. No. <laughs> it's maybe I missed up something. Uh, so this is. Um, um, basically, components of the um, plan. Permaculture. Ah, permaculture. Ah. Okay. Okay. So there <laughs> is some so, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is these green areas that also worked as a, let's say, um, shop. You can uh, find crops, buy crops, try. Uh, and this is uh, one of our contribution. So in the future, uh, there will be three types of uh, agriculture, and permaculture is uh, one of them, combining different crops. And uh, it's more uh, like um, uh, artificial landscape. So that's also how we want to show that this landscape is more nature and it's more artificial, thoughtfully created. Um, maybe to summarize, we would like to go through our five propositions that form the base of our collective design. So. I think as you do that, I suspect Ilma shares these questions. We've got kind of two, there's two areas that we kind of need further illumination on, or would like. We don't need it, but we'd like further illumination on, I should say. One is the, and it comes back to the kind of question about hypersanitation and the kind of apparent kind of massive redundancy of space, is what is the relationship between the supermarket and disease? Or what is the relationship to it, between it and the healthy body and the diseased body? Is there some kind of assumption that pandemics are, are here to stay, and that the typological transformation that's happened through an acute moment actually becomes permanent, and this it permanently becomes a, a place where you need to shop always 1.5 meters away from anyone else, um, or is it? not a pragmatic thing, but it's a kind of aesthetic shift that's kind of underpinned by some other kind of logic. So I think, I think that, I don't think you've addressed that really. Um, and then the other question, and also it's a spatial question, is a question that Ilma raised that you didn't answer, which is what is the really the relationship between this forum-like supermarket that as you point out, centralizes distribution, but ultimately decentralizes shopping, um, and the landscape. The landscape that's producing the food that it's selling, and in a sense also the landscape that is occupied by the people who are consuming the calories, because obviously this is about a calorie distribution system, isn't it? It's about how you get biomass into society. Uh, consuming the calories that they're buying there. So I think there's there's a kind of there are two there are two big picture questions. One is really cultural, to do with the construction of the healthy and the construction of the, the diseased and how society relates to that. And then the other is really basically biological, how light is photosynthesized into sugar, generates calories, gets into a supermarket, gets out of a supermarket into a body that basically runs around and works and fuels the economy. So if there's a desire to stick to the schedule, these are points that we can return to as we go through the individual projects. I just kind of think there should be a consciousness about these questions and the way you respond to the, in you, you unpack your individual projects. I think that's a great idea. We have uh, some individual contributions that talk about uh, health, uh, body, 
um, Jacqueline, for example, uh, but I think Nishi has something to, to add. No, I was just going to say that it's going to be more evident in the individual contributions as well, because um, we have split the 10 contributions into groups of five, and the format of the um, what you'll see uh, is also based on how each product from these 10 contributions um, in juxtaposition with the building types and the extensive territories are converging at this one supermarket and how are they modifying the entire supply chain through that uh, contribution. So I think we can begin with the first group. From The Hague to Genoa, the supply chain of the future supermarket will span across the Blue Banana trade corridor, addressing multifaceted aspects of the food industry in the Netherlands and beyond through the notions of scarcity, trade, inclusivity, sensorialism, taste-making, craft, reshoring, protectionism, automation, and extinction. The reimagined supermarket Albert displays both the product and its supply chain for the conscious consumers by integrating the distribution center with an automated Ocado grid system above the supermarket, rendering a completely open sales floor. In an attempt to reduce waste and address sustainability goals, Albert operates with a just-in-time production system of non-disposable packaging and dynamic pricing, maintaining small batches of products in the integrated distribution center. No longer an enclosed and controlled retail space, the supermarket uses various strategies such as store-in-a-store -store rentals for exclusive brands and specialty displays for seasonal products to create a flexible sales floor in order to maximize profit, operating as a real estate platform. Novel tasting experiences and green public spaces, along with the dynamic robotic movement that diverts human labor towards hospitality and social interaction, blur the boundaries between the supermarket and the city, introducing a new civic presence. Yes, and now we can begin with the first five individual contributions. Where are you starting? Yeah. So the order of these a individual contributions. A multidisciplinary experiment in Wageningen explores the future of farming from genetic modification to permaculture and from lab-produced seeds to land-cultivated crops, the laboratory suggests an Okay. Sorry. So um, the order of the 10 contributions today and how you'll see them are based on the blue banana and the locations within the blue banana. So we begin from the Netherlands and we span all the way till um, Italy and Switzerland. That's how the order today for each presentation will go. It can go on the floor. Can we start the first contribution, please? A multidisciplinary experiment in Wageningen explores the future of farming, from genetic modification to permaculture and from lab-produced seeds to land-cultivated crops, the laboratory suggests an alternative trajectory to crop cultivation, both in Wageningen's existing ecosystem as well as in other natural ecosystems across the world. A central linear axis overlooking the crops composes laboratory's functional spine and becomes the public viewpoint of the experiment where visitors and experts from all around the world meet with academics from Wageningen University, members of Food Valley NL, an organization that fights against chronic hunger across the world, and scientists and growers from the laboratory. The facility's amphitheater suggests a space of discourse on the implication of GM production on agriculture, hosting lectures and discussions on the potential and benefits of the emergent medium. 
the crop seeds, whether local or exotic, begin a cell culture in a biosafety level 2 laboratory. Scientists, specially trained in handling biohazardous and pathogenic materials, change the attributes of seeds through genetic modification. In controlled growth facilities, a variety of rooms offer precise environmental control for the growth of high or low light plants through the use of a top down airflow pattern. Out of the laboratory stretches an area where three different methods of farming, monoculture, strip cropping, and pixel farming are tested. Research here is based on the collection of data concerning crop yield, pest control, biodiversity, pollination, nutrient cycling, water regulation, and soil fertility. Meanwhile, at the eastern side of the laboratory, a different experiment testing water tolerance is conducted. Through water management techniques, parts of the land are regularly flooded in an attempt to create deep water and flash flood tolerant plants similar to the traits of rice. Seeds are subjected one next to the other to various environmental conditions testing not only their climatic resilience, but also their productive complementarity, forming clusters of companion plant seeds in the geothermal greenhouses towards the north. The laboratory works with nature rather than against it by observing and taking advantage of the existing surrounding ecosystem as a whole, Instead of treating any area as a single product system, the lab-land constructive relationship is epicenter to the experiment, challenging the traditional view of the laboratory as an isolated, sterile enclave. The cultivation of the seeds is succeeded by a process of storage and evaluation that can last up to three years. The approved seeds are then collected in a seed vault designed to safely host the arsenal of novel local and exotic seeds produced through the experiments. The seed can now be cultivated in different environments all around the world. Thus, for example, a peach, a stone fruit that is threatened by extinction and is normally grown in temperate conditions, can now be sent to a tropical environment, while a seed of amaranth, originally cultivated in North and South America, can grow next to its European companions. As the seeds travel and grow around the world, the prevalence of monoculture is challenged by the benefits of permaculture, increasing production through biodiversity and making GMOs part of the organic farming process. After the cultivation of the seeds, the crops will be harvested and reinfused to the blue banana stream, allowing the Netherlands both to alter its crop and sustain its production against the threat of flooding by combining GM techniques with organic farming. During harvesting, the quality of crops is checked by expert growers. Crops that produce beans are placed in flat areas to dry, while crops for consumption are washed. After sorting and processing, the crops are now properly labeled as genetically engineered organic, with a price lookup code that starts with the number 8 denoting the use of genetic modification, and then a 9 indicating that they were cultivated according to the principles of organic and sustainable farming. The distribution process to the Dutch food industry begins. The crops, already mature enough, are packaged in jars to maintain their freshness and enhance their long-lasting quality, as well as to comply with the Alberts packaging policies. The jars are then heavily bubble-wrapped and padded, with the ripening process of the contents slowed down by cooling packs and insulated pads. The crops that survived extreme conditions caused by climate change travel from the Blue Banana and beyond to supply Albert's Integrated Distribution Center in Delft.
In 2030, the products threatened with extinction, such as avocados, bananas, wine grapes, strawberries, stone fruits, soybeans, wheat, maize, rice and chickpeas, are revitalized through their genetic modification and redistributed to the market to be offered in supermarket shelves. Smart shopping carts display information regarding product origin countries, while barcodes on the jars explain farming processes, particularly highlighting seed production and distribution. As an essential service, the supermarket incorporates inter integrated agriculture strategies, accentuating a new civic presence within the supermarket and diluting the opacity of GM production that currently induces bias and subsequently control patent monopolization. Farmers can also witness a demonstration of various organically farmed, genetically modified seeds inside the supermarket, turning the green areas into a space of profit. Through a barcode, consumers are informed about specific characteristics of crops and companion plants that they can now order. Scarcity is now reversed, extinction is averted, and biodiversity is enhanced. The crops of avocados, bananas, wine grapes, strawberries, stone fruits, coffee, soybeans, wheat, maize, rice, and chickpeas are now saved and available for consumption. An alternative dairy farm model emerges in the Netherlands, reshoring the global supply chain of the dairy industry. As per Dutch government regulations, the farm animal industry has pivoted away from export production to soccer agriculture, bringing production and consumption closer together. The city once again establishes itself as the natural habitat for farm animals. The proximity of farms, production blocks and direct consumption areas provokes a new culture of private animal ownership. The whole milk factory farm is located in the multi-scale neighborhoods of The Hague. Livestock fields are implemented in the urban context and surrounded by perimeter with milking station, production blocks and food silos, which contributes towards a shift in livestock welfare. A cow named Berta takes shelter in the timber barn to avoid rain and direct sun. She produces about 60 kg of manure each day that collected in the underground biogas tank system, providing energy for the production blocks. While grazing, Berta eats from food stalls, thereby maintaining the land of the plot. The food stalls are supplied from the food silos by feeding robots with grains and vegetables, partially supplemented by the waste food of citizens, restaurants and supermarkets. The haha and watering ponds subdivide fields with different types of animals, like sheep, goats and donkeys that are farmed within the city. Usually Berta visits the milking station twice a day. There a milking robot carefully cleans Berta's teats, collects the milk, and transfers it into a raw milk tank, all within five minutes. The milk is then transferred to the production blocks. Raw milk is homogenized and pasteurized and then stored within fresh milk tanks. To always have fresh milk, the previous day's milk is converted into yogurt and butter. Automated feeding, milking and cleaning systems reduce pressure on the farm animals and allow for close proximity in the dense urban context. Customers can fill up with their dairy product directly from the storage tanks. In the presence of the animals, they started it all. The home milk factory is open for citizens with private animals, for other farmers willing to supply their milk by placing their field cans into the production block, and for supplies to supermarket chains such as Albera. Standardized 20-liter stainless steel cans simplify the link between dairy production and consumption, allowing users to exchange their empty cans for filled ones. 15 factories farm can satisfy the dairy demand of the Hague.
The reproduction in its city itself makes it unnecessary to integrate with the national level distribution network. Fresh dairy products can avoid Albert logistics and go directly to supermarkets. The whole milk factory farm balances profits with production, eventually helping farmers, producers and suppliers become more equal players in the market. A digital logistics system regulates the quantity of cans between the whole milk factory and Albert distributors and delivery services, thus reducing the overproduction and waste. The whole milk factory farm distributes surplus dairy products via an Albert distribution center, where cans are stored in two degree freezers. At 8 am and 6 pm, fresh dairy cans are shipped to the closest Alberta store. Supermarket employees manually place these cans into integrated dispensers. Customers can then use these dispensers themselves, filling a jar with the dairy product and receiving a printed sticker with information about milk from Bert and her friends. The bulk shelves have indicated for the quantity of the production connected with the logistics system, so the bulk shelf is always topped up where the supermarket access is minimized. When the can is finally empty, it is exchanged for a full one and it's taken back to the production block to fill it with the fresh milk the next day. While unsold milk is distributed back as well, to be turned into butter, which has longer shelf life. The range of dairy products with different expiration characteristics helps balance dairy production with consumption. Thus, consumers can always find fresh milk, yogurt and butter on the bulk shelf, while livestock are not exploded by overproduction. In the wake of an increasingly pescatarian society, the consumption of meat is said to drop to its lowest levels. Meanwhile, one-third of the global fisheries have been flagged as overfished. Improved aquaculture can meet the demand while replacing the practice of industrial fishing, thus reducing the pressures that are pushing marine species towards extinction. Pink is not a color, envision a new land-based aquaponics shrimp farm, which rears breeds and harvests white Pacific shrimp in an artificial ecosystem capable of mimicking Ecuadorian mangroves. A new shrimp network located in Germany and connected to the existing northern crustacean supply corridor will produce and distribute two tons of fresh shrimp every week. Germany, a country inside the blue banana and the largest salt producer in Europe, anticipates a new prototypical network that works in symbiosis with existing salt factories in order to share resources such as salt extraction and residual heat. The existing both salt mine, regional soil conditions and the Rhine River make Rheinberg an ideal location in which the monolithic volume of the aquaponic farm works in tune with the existing industrial landscape perceived from the highway as part of the existing master plan. Regularity, infinity, and the absence of a center compose a geometry that contains the relationship between multiple entities through three different environments. The human ecosystem, the seal and dark productive volume, and the logistical ground floor. The 120-day incubation cycle of the White Pacific Stream reveals the different stages of development not only determining the special qualities for each phase, but also creating a repetitive rhythm that combines animal welfare with productivity. February 1st, the eggs are submerged and incubated for 24 hours with a water temperature of 28 degrees and atmospheric humidity of 70%. February 2nd, after 24 hours, the larvae and salt tablets provided by the mine are placed in maturation tanks for one month in order to complete the second stage of shrimp growth. On this floor, students and researchers regulate healthy development of the larvae, all while learning the benefits of ecologic aquaculture. March 1st, the larvae are transported to growing tanks via vertical conveyor belts which imitate natural tides thanks to their helical movement. On this floor, a special repetition and scale bring sublime qualities to this sealed dark volume 
where the sturdiness of the tanks is combined with light walkways in order to create two different levels. March 15. Green leaves catalyze the growing process. Water is pumped out of the stream tank and into aquaponic beds, creating a closed-loop water system through which the stream provides nutrients for the plants, while the plants clean the water for the stream. From the control rooms, the technicians supervise the hatching, which takes place underwater, and at a base set by demand. In parallel to the hatching processes, workers engage in a different rhythm, enjoying the facilities located on the rooftop, revaluating the industrial landscape together with the recycled crude facade, which reduces 4,000 single-use plastic forks per square meter. The exterior gardens function as extensions of several pavilions, bringing nature inside the building. Six different courtyards are attached to the laser and learning areas and act as flexible program spaces. Adjacent to the training center, the laboratories function with indirect light provided by the sawtooth rooftop. Long stainless steel tables organize the space and ensure hygienic conditions for the dissection of crustaceans. The staff canteen is open to visitors who come to taste the fresh shrimp farmed in an industrial landscape. Dishes circulate on top of conveyor belts that connect the tables together, enabling a dynamic atmosphere where freshly cooked food moves through the space. May 29th. Once the animals are fully grown, they are vertically transported to the ground floor, where quality control and labeling take place. This floor showcases the dynamic choreography between the control process, vertical production elements, and the tracks. After spending 24 hours in the fasting tanks, clusters of 50 shrimp are transferred to cubic meter tanks. Accompanied by water oxygen regulators, the shrimp are transported without food in their stomach in order to avoid the presence of feces and thus nitrogen. The processing lines combine the green leaves and the shrimp in the same space, where the oxygen tanks are checked and lettuce is cleaned before being placed in pallets. The last stage is packaging and labeling, where a farm responsible sticker is added to the products, reflecting the animal welfare and zero waste principles of the facility. During the first 100 kilometers of transport, the truck crosses the industrial landscape of the Ruhr Basin, where one can perceive the new volumes adjacent to the older salt factories. The new monolithic constructions block the boundaries between artificial and natural, creating a new collective understanding of the ocean and the culture of fishing. At the supermarket, the ambient display of live seafood showcases the highly controlled and technical aquaponics stream farm that is designed to avoid marine extinction. A new relationship between humans and animals emerges within the supermarket, where the consumer is lured by the walkways that cross the stream ponds. Life and natural stream swim inside the water ponds. Through the purified water, the consumer observes the pigment-free colors of the species within their artificial habitats, triggering a new perception of freshness at the same time. In Vogelwaarde, the Netherlands, a four and a half hectare family owned orchard grows 10 varieties of apples and pears, ranging from early braid to L star and from Confrance to Comis. Challenged by climate change, soil salinization, and economy, the proprietor's livelihood relies completely on the harvest success and the subsequent sales of raw and processed fruit. To secure the future of the orchard, this contribution proposes a diversification of the business by adding a media program to the site. The existing orchard is converted to the taste-making estate by densifying the existing plot and adding an architectural program for recipe development, cooking demonstrations and video recording. The conversion welcomes a compact team of kitchen and media staff to produce recipes and cooking instructions for manufacturers and home cooks, incorporating apples, pears and derivatives such as puree, vinegar and syrup. A one-story open and transparent structure offers clear views and access to other on-site operations, keeping staff well informed of each other's activities.
through close connections with wholesalers, supermarkets, and other orchards, the taste-making estate proprietor is aware of market forecasts and media metrics that can affect the supply chain, ingredient stock, and pricing. Navigating this information, the taste-making estate aims to supply tasty, healthy, sustainable, and profitable products to supermarkets and shoppers. In specially built kitchens, recipes are tested and developed according to market conditions. For example, a surplus of flour is mitigated through the promotion of chunky Dutch apple pie, targeted towards a willing audience through a suitable platform or medium. Developed cooking instructions are written by a resident food editor to be published online, disseminating traditional media, or shared with wholesalers. Despite a fragmented and polarized audience, media, from TikTok influencers to in-store magazines, have the potential to reach anyone that eats. Cooking demonstrations are hosted by either resident chefs or guests, celebrity cooks, culinary professionals, and online influencers who are invited to create new recipes for their target audiences. In addition to recipe development, the kitchen is utilized to shoot food and cooking demonstrations. Space is allocated to accommodate shooting equipment and allow recording crew to move around. To ensure food styling and cooking demonstrations can be done, a pantry for shelf and refrigerated ingredients is stored along with a variety of tableware and accessories. Less than an hour from major logistics facilities, the taste-making estate's pantry can be stocked promptly. Aside from tastemakers presenting cooking demonstrations, their imagery features ingredients, kitchenware and tableware, which are all potential products for sale in the cooperating supermarkets. The kitchen space opens up outside, offering a view on the rest of the estate. The orchard that produces the incorporated ingredients is transformed into a seasonal backdrop for cooking shows. Controllable lighting and sun shading ensure desired working and recording conditions regarding light and temperature while providing a view on the orchard during shoots. Off-screen, mounting points for recording equipment such as lights, reflectors and cameras for recurring shots for cooking demonstrations can be found in the ceiling amid ventilation shafts and acoustic material. Post-production in the offices lead to the handoff of digital material, videos, photos and recipes to wholesalers, internet platforms and editorial offices. The taste-making estate's content is further processed, ending up in various places, from daytime television to Instagram feeds. Special cooperation with the grocer includes printed recipe cards and features in their own store magazine. Recipes and photographs are processed by an editorial staff before being printed, packaged and distributed. Through online magazines, internet platforms and meal planning apps, web-based services complement traditional media and the physical supermarket in terms of sales, introducing new taste and convenience to online shoppers. A touch of a button fills a virtual cart with a week of dinners. Still operational, a compact production line processes and packages produce on site. Apples and pears are peeled, cut and sliced, or pressed to puree and juice in the processing garage before being jarred or bottled for longevity. The processed ingredients are stored in refrigeration or ready for transport in reusable containers before being dispatched to the final point of sale. The shed's interior connects to the road through concrete pavement, allowing machinery and trucks access from the N290, a provincial road connecting to the Blue Bananas infrastructure and the Albert in Delft. Through this network, the orchard and others like it consolidate their produce, allowing them to be distributed throughout the region. This collaborative effort enables the orchard to take part in the region's supply chain by contributing their modest yields, expert knowledge of a specific type of produce, and collaboration with tastemakers. Products arrive in the supermarket in crates and containers part of a modular 80 by 80 cm system before entering a robotized area. By reorganizing products, pantry kits are assembled within the supermarket.
On the sales floor, slow and fast-paced areas pertain to different shoppers. Cooking demonstrations feature produce from different Albert suppliers, informing and inspiring shoppers with new culinary possibilities, blurring the boundary between education and seduction. Pre-sorting crates, pantry kits offer shoppers a convenient way of doing groceries while challenging them to create tasty and low-waste meals. Other shoppers collect their products either manually or pre-sorted through the grocer's e-commerce platform. Collected in the shopper's cart, previously atomized ingredients form the mise en place for a meal. Through media and recipe development, the orchard harnesses the larger supply chain through its taste-making facility in order to secure its future existence. Werkendam, the Netherlands. Extreme weather events and diseases force the Dutch potato growers to subdivide their arable lands and plant wide varieties. Such production mode is made possible by reintroducing the role of a wholesale market that congregates supply and demand. Potato growers carefully plan their fields, cultivating several varieties to reach a profitable composition thanks to precise farming advancements. During the harvest season, farmers sort their fresh potatoes and prepare sample crates, representative crates of batches of varieties ready for sale, to bring to the wholesale market for auctions. The potato grower's truck arrives at the wholesale market and parks at one of the loading docks. Before the crates are put on display, they are examined in a designated area to specify their varieties, qualities, and market channels. In addition, potato growers will receive a red trade card identifying where their products will be auctioned. Sample crates are placed on the ground floor of the wholesale market, waiting to be lifted to the upper floor by hydraulic elevators. On the other hand, buyers enter the building from a perpendicular angle. They examine and test the quality of exhibit samples while updating their purchasing lists. Members ascend through stairs to the main lounge, further proceeding to the trading floor. All auctions start at 8 o'clock sharp in the morning. A potato crate is brought up and placed in the center of the auction pit. An auctioneer stands by it, conducting the process of selling and buying. The auction clock in the front displays the product's identity code, current price, and buyer who wins the bid. All the information produced on the trading floor is stored and published in real time at the archive next to the trading floor. Data transparency plays a crucial role in building trust in the market. Above the trading floor, a cafe sits on the mezzanine level. Members can exchange information about the potato supply chain with a clear sight of the giant quotation board surrounding the entire space. Members also come here to watch and study the market trend. Farmers predict certain varieties that will be popular next year and calculate the cost of growing and storing. In contrast to an enclosed industrial shed, the wholesale market opens the trading floor to the public to further foster trust beyond the exchange of products. Meanwhile, on the farm, once the deal is settled, workers receive delivery details and start to load crates onto a waiting truck of the buyer. The truck leaves the farm and enters the highway system in the Dutch rural area. Trucks, carrying potatoes bought by Alba, go onto the motorway A27 the highway that runs through the entire region, and drive to Martinus Ne Hof Laan. The destination of trucks is Martinus Ne Hof Laan in Delft, a newly developed residential area of the historical town. The growing population facilitates the need for a new supermarket that incorporates the food supply, local business, and community space. The truck with potato slowly drives onto the loading area of all bear next to the Ocado distribution system core. The Ocado robot unloads potato crates from the truck bed while calculating the price combination of the day and informing the customers in the supermarket. The Ocado robot slowly drops down the crate upon reaching the designated spot. The rituality of distributing products within the supermarket raises the customer's attention. Customers, either searching in the smart cart interface or approaching the shelf, get the information of the potatoes. Then, owing to the checkout system built in the smart cart, customers scan and weigh their potatoes while putting them into the cart. 
As different varieties and volumes of potatoes are brought to All Bears sales floor each day, the price fluctuates. As a result, customers compare potatoes of diverse types, from different farms, and with varying quantities, which facilitates a rising awareness of the provenance of potatoes and instigates more participation in the supply chain. Now we would like to open the discussion about these first five contributions, so the floor is yours. Yes, maybe a little bit of uh, clarification. These uh, special narratives depict how our products, the products connected to our contributions, are uh, uh, Actually, they are journey from our sites toward to the supermarket, Albert. And uh, I don't know if the audience has uh, any question or. Mm -hmm. Of course. Thank you very much. I like the movies very much. I have a question regarding quantities. <laughs> and you all would expect this question, of course. Taking into account that all the narratives provided by the five of you highly depend on numbers. Numbers of crop produced, numbers of potatoes provided, quantities of shrimp brought to the market. So I assume either of you have a very precise knowledge of, let's say, the quantity that is provided or offered uh, by the future Albert, uh, whatever we call it, supermarket, the 2030 supermarket, and that you have a clear understanding of what comes in and what has to go out either day. So, in fact, it's a question for all you, you five simultaneously. So we presume that we understand how many apples we need per day. We presume that we know what the orchard is producing in a season. We understand, let's say, the number of days necessary to, to grow shrimp. But we, I honestly still don't know have any feeling or any connection with the quantities uh, you are suggesting to us? Is this a viable scenario in order to feed, let's say, a city of 80,000 inhabitants? Or is it a viable scenario to feed, I don't know, 20,000 inhabitants on an annual or on a daily mm. basis? Could you, could you help me out? So I yeah. want to have a, an answer from all five persons presenting. You, you want one answer? Only from you. Yeah. Ah, you want one answer that uh, for all of us, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. for each of us. Okay, let's start with H O S O shrimp, white Pacific shrimp that grow in Ecuadorian mangroves. Um, in my case, um, calculating the quantity of shrimp uh, was crucial because. Uh, the farm ensures also animal welfare. And this was one of the points of departure, to understand that farming fish or farming shrimp, uh, it also has something to do with animals per cubic meters. So when I first started understanding that shrimp is a cheap product, uh, at least in the basic garnaling ready-made, should be a basic cheap product. And then I moved to the world of uh, growing in shrimp indoor in Germany. Um, it was a bit naive in the, in the beginning because even if it seems that the, the building, it's, uh, it could talk about uh, mass production, it doesn't because in order to ensure this uh, animal welfare and the rotational system of aquaculture, 
you can only grow uh, four kilograms per cubic meter, and this means two tons of shrimp per week, which means around uh, the consumption of 10 supermarkets. So um, I don't know if this sums up a little bit the, my story. Um, what, more questions? <laughs> I have one question related to that. Because let's say you assume that we go to another way of producing food. You assume that we take into account animal welfare, etc. Mm -hmm. So that has a direct relation with pricing. It also has a direct relation with the kind of nutrition we would like to take either day. So could you, could you help me out there? Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what, what I was saying, that in the beginning, I, I, I wanted to solve the world and pro produce a cheap product, but um, in the end, this um, live shrimp at the supermarket cannot be, cannot be cheap. Um, but this carries an ethical question. Yes. So in the future, within eight years, eh, this is a scenario that happens within eight years, only the rich will eat shrimp. Is that correct? So the sad, the sad answer to this is at least this product that is an HOSO is a shrimp that you buy with a head on. Yes, it's a, it's a luxury. So. It's very sad, but they already made garnale, or garnale already, already boiled, that we consume so much in the north of Europe, will be for everyone, but this HOSO shrimp will be only for um, some of us, at least until we uh, find a more balanced way so, of producing and also... So to summarize your contribution, is that then a dystopic or a utopic vision? or just mere realism? It's mm, realism. It's not a utopic at all. Because in the end, I'm saying this is expensive. I, I'm so sorry, but this, uh, I mean, eating fresh shrimp from Germany, it's expensive. OK, thank you very much. Okay, so when it comes to the crop production in uh, the side of uh, Vahengen floodplain, um, this land, this uh, two kilometer to 500 meter, um, let's say, uh, length landscape has uh, the capacity to produce around 30,000 tons of crops, five of them are uh, grains. However, per when annum, it comes... Right? Uh, in either year? Hmm? In a year? I, yes. Okay. So, but uh, when it detail. comes... Thank you, sorry for not clarifying. So, but when it comes to my project, it is not uh, so much related to the production and the, to the direct uh, connection uh, with a supermarket, but uh, but uh, it concerns the idea of uh, producing knowledge and expertise when it comes to the um, sci scientific approach towards the crops. So it refers to a global network. It refers to the idea of a genetically modified crop. Its patent uh, arrives, goes, travels through around the world, from the Netherlands to uh, the world, and um, vice versa, so that the food uh, scarcity can uh, re be reversed, and the two billion people can be f fed. That's the idea. Not of these 30 tons, I guess. Uh, the two million people who who is fed by these two million people? What? Yeah, so my project, uh, what I mean is uh, that um, my project is linked with the idea that um, with scarcity. Yeah. And uh, I got that part. deals with the projection of the... I only want to, could you please summarize again the tons and the two million people? 
No, I, I when I, uh, I said that the the, the landscape the, in Wageningen can produce 30,000 tons at this I'm point per year. I, okay, and then how do I get to the two million people from there? From no, it is about exporting the knowledge. That 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 is how it is. It is a project linked with the idea of producing scientific knowledge over the crops and uh, producing also patents that can be uh, travel around the world so that crops are produced in different localities. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I got that. Yeah. Um, the project, um, the contribution uh, whole milk is a dairy f uh, farm factory in uh, the neighborhood of The Hague, and uh, it is uh, the capacity is a 1,500 milk dairy production in day that uh, should supply 2,000 people, because I assume per day, yeah? per day. Indeed. Okay. Let's go on. And uh, I assume that uh, this is um, a kind of network that implemented in a city. So I have different uh, size of the plots. I differentiate them from L, M, and S. Uh, and uh, I calculate average consumption and uh, the um, population and uh, density of population. So I uh, speculate that 15 farms like this will cover the consumption of uh, 54,000 people living in The Hague. And uh, my uh, contribution works within the Alberta uh, directly. So I both supply people uh, via my uh, farm and uh, via Alberta. So it's, a, it's the same proximity because Alberta also let's say, neighborhood, like based in the neighborhood, as well as this farm based in the neighborhood. Uh, there are two things I do not understand still. And I won't ask uh, my questions regarding the kilos and the tons and the heaps of shit, but it's a question of pricing. Yeah. As you know, there's an incredible treasure, uh, pressure on pricing. Let's say milk becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Sometimes it's even cheaper than water. Yeah, in our country at least, but also in Denmark. And that's, that's preposterous. So if we then localize and, uh, let's say, downgrade the production to a neighborhood level, I guess that has a direct influence on the price. Yes. Hence, I would like to, sp I would like to ask you to speculate on the pricing of the milk. And the second question related to that is, if I produce my milk, or if my milk is produced in my neighborhood, why would I go then to the supermarket? So I don't get that. Yes, so the first um, question about pricing. So I assume that the price will um, increase anyway, because now in the Netherlands there is an ongoing uh, company of um, farming construction. So it will um, make a price increase and uh, uh, on the one hand 40% um, of the price in a, sh in a uh, supermarket is uh, the price for logistic and for rent so I speculate that if I have it in uh, my neighborhood I don't need to supply it with any kind of logistic you can come and pick by yourself so that's how, how I balance the price. Yeah, hence, hence, I do not need the supermarket anymore. Yes, about the supermarket, it's uh, uh, just uh, in terms of the supply. So in a Delft, for example, you can have four uh, far, uh, farms. In a Hague, for example, it's 15 farms. But I assume there will be uh, maybe 30 Alberta. So it's more distribute, more, um, how to say, like more... Um, Pixelated, more, more more yeah, dispersed. More dispersed. So yeah. one farm can supply to Alberta, for example. Okay. Good answer. I like Thank your you. last answer. From the, we go to the earth potato, earth apple later. Um, 
the apple orchard, as I mentioned, was a small one, four and a half hectares, and it produces enough to feed approximate 10,000 people. So that's a th tenth of the city of Delft. So that's not a lot. Um, so what, hence, what, what is then, let's say, the economic validity of this proposal? Well, that's uh, the kind of the point I'm, uh, let's say, the, the start um, of this project in this area of Zeeland. There's a large number of farms, agricultural companies with a, a, a surface area of less than 30 hectares. Um, uh, statistics show that uh, companies smaller than this size, they have trouble to maintain a position within the food industry. So uh, hence the suggestion or the proposal to diversify towards media, towards another way to stay involved within uh, feeding the world and uh, uh, developing recipes using the existing site. Um, uh, so in that sense, um, the viability or the feasibility of this project shifts towards uh, uh, yeah, the other uh, types of output which uh, a supermarket creates. Uh, in the case of, well, the exemplar for Albert, Albert Heijn, uh, has the Allerhande magazine. Uh, it is the se second or the first largest uh, magazine in print which is free, the second after uh, the Campune with a printing run of 1.2 million. So in that sense, uh, yeah, they um, they greatly, um, if they were, are able to uh, uh, tap into this network, um, that will greatly uh, increase their uh, exposure and their way of dealing in the food uh, food industry. Okay, I, I buy your answer for now. I have one question regarding the potatoes and the seasons. Uh, we won't go into the discussion whether we are a city boy or a country boy, but I liked your movie. I enjoyed the narrative, but I didn't get the influence of the season. Explain me whether your proposal still works, let's say, today or somewhere in February, and then take into account that there's a season and a rhythm in crop. Yes, so uh, based on the, the, the research, the one thing that a potato farmer always has, uh, a potato farmer always has to think about is uh, this, this year uh, he or she harvests this amount of potato, how much should he or she sell immediately to get a, a, like an instant uh, income? And, but that means that also means it, during harvest season from from July to August is or uh, to even to late uh, early September, it is always a bit a lot because there is a lot of supply. So that means the price is lower. But then he has to uh, think about the cost in storaging them because uh, already in like in the later season, uh, later months. I mean after September, you can sell them in a higher price. But also, there is a risk in storaging all these potatoes because potato are, I mean, storaging like big quantity of potato aren't actually, as, yeah, as easy as it sounded, it, yeah, sounded like. So, part of uh, my contribution about this, um, the information exchange about the the, the market uh, observing is for farmers to calculate um, um, his own, or to figure out his own plan of uh, this harvest. So for, for a potato farmer, like before he even harvests this, like the last October, he was already um, starting to, to see or to predict the, 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 the market trend. So yeah, maybe this year there might be like a, like a lower, um, Yield, so so he will try to store more potatoes, waiting for a, a better timing to sell this potato for a better price, and that is uh, one thing I forgot to mention. That is for the direct consumption potatoes, and also is the kind of potatoes uh, my contribution is uh, mainly trading with. Okay. Um, I 
I, I really enjoyed all those films as well. I, in, a, in a funny way, what I want to try to do is to talk around some of the things at stake in what you're doing. I, I really appreciate Mikhail's getting, you know, getting you to pin down the quantitative mic logics quantitative parameters, which I think you know you could have actually have included in a kind of running data stream up the side of the film, um, and to test those. But in a sense, if we can kind of talk around some of the things, it seems to me that what's going on, what you're primarily doing in constructing these different micro logics, which is great, it's almost like kind of a 19th century novel, the way everything is addressed. You know, you're kind of coming at, coming at the supermarket from every possible angle, and constructing the narratives behind it, as I hear from Salomon, look, speculating at changing bits of legislation, looking at how genetically modified, the stigma about, about genetic modification can to, to a degree be neutralized if we also declare it organic, although you don't address who owns the intellectual property, which is ultimately the real problem with genetic modification. But I'll assume that, you know, in one of your many micrologics, you've addressed that too. So. We're presented with all of these different things being addressed, and that's highly laudable. I guess there's two aspects of that it would be good if you could address. One is, where is the space for self-criticality here? And I don't mean you being insecure about what you've done, <laughs> but I do mean you say, well, if I fix this, I unravel that. And if I fix that, this unravels. So what do I do? Because in a sense, it's all too neatly, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, and all, there's, it's devoid of conflict. It's devoid of dilemma. And I just don't believe it. And I don't think you believe it either. And there's something about, and this, ten, this then comes to the next thing I'd like you to address, which is your... I hope, dissatisfaction with representation. Because part of what makes it all seem so neat is the way you've animated the films. The, the kind of almost infantile simplicity of the films. You know, it's almost, it's almost drawn for children. And you're dealing with very complex, messy problems and literally, there's mess in these films. There's shit, there's horse shit, the prawns smell, the shrimp smell when they go off. If you don't change the water fast enough, it's slimy. I mean, you know, the milk goes off in the canister. You've got to, I mean, there's just, it's, it seems that there's a whole, um, there's not only uh, real world and pragmatic complexity and conflict to what you're dealing with, but there's also actually sensorial and aesthetic complexity and mess to what you're dealing with. So this is not to say that um, the films aren't kind of doing the job, but the films are only doing part of the job. And so what is the antidote to, what is the antidote to those films? What, is, what could be, because the whole project, it seems to me, from the most kind of remote corner of your micrologics to the culmination in the supermarket that's kind of super spacious and shiny and white, as we've discussed, is about the creation of value, isn't it? That's what you're all working on, is how we create value, how we change what we value. And if we can change what we value enough, we'll be prepared to pay way more for it. You know, we will change. If we kind of say, okay, we've got to produce apples this way, otherwise we don't have bees, and if we don't have bees, we're really stuffed. You know, I mean, there's a whole, you know, if we don't just eat three prawns a day and leave the ocean alone, we're stuffed. Therefore, we're happily pay a lot for these prawns. So in a sense, you are completely rolling up your sleeves and getting into the detail of what architects have always done. It's absolutely our role, is to lead in societal shifts. And to lead in paradigm shifts and societal shifts, we need to somehow push, mutate, distort, reconfigure value creation systems. And to do that, we have to seduce. We have to be really masters of representation. And we have to be convincing, but we have to also 
incorporate a, if we're to convince everyone and if we're to convince, convince curious and intelligent people, we have to incorporate criticality. We have to invite the audience into the doubt, into the complexity of what we're talking about. And I think there's, there's an absence of that in those films. And I feel like there's an absence of, th and that somehow feeds up into, if the supermarket is the tip of the iceberg of your work, and at the bottom of the iceberg is all these micro-logics, somehow it's percolating up into the supermarket. And perhaps that's what's produced in the 1950s. I don't know. But I just think, I think, you know, we should be trying to grab this moment to talk around these very difficult ideas and the kind of very difficult role that, struggle that we have with representation. Yeah, I'm thinking how to respond about this idea of uh, uh, the problem of representation through, I mean, like you said, right, we're supposed to seduct, seduct, uh, seduce and convince people that this is the right way forward, right? So in doing the opposite or showing the, well, the dirtiness or the, um, yeah, what, what kind of medium or way of inquiry would expose these, um, well, the shit in the, in the case of uh, uh, the whole milk contribution. You, you talked a lot about uh, this as well, right? About the uh, um, uh, uh, uh the nitrogen uh, uh, output. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is, is some No, it's on now. While you think about that answer, I'm going to take a digression to talk about representation. So, um, no, you don't listen to me. Think about the answer to the question that has just been posed, because you already know this, what I'm saying. Um, what we did here was um, the video and these renderings that are here have been outsourced. So basically a list of instructions, so the model the student's 3D modeled everything. Then the, a list of instructions, because you were talking about the 1950s representation, mm -hmm. with a list of instructions of what to render mm -hmm. to um, somebody that they found. They gave a, so setting a kind of tone or a visualization. I mean, this for me was a, well, it's been on a long list of pedagogical experiments to see what, what that would do. Also, as an analogy to contemporary forms of practice where, you know, somebody like Mihil spends you know, 15,000 euros to get that one winning image. So what could that be in terms of how do you write the instruction list of the kind of quality, spatial quality, material quality, where the ideas are? So just I want to just use this moment to acknowledge that because I think that that's a really powerful one. What does it mean to render shiny tomatoes? What does it mean to render shiny tomatoes or a deep uh, purple aubergine? Etc. Along with the kind of, um, you know, a metallic materia, materiality, you know, and these things as a kind of, uh, as another kind of micro logic to think things through. I mean, I mean, I guess it's it's a kind of interest. It's interesting that you outsource the representation, but whether we outsource representation or we do it ourselves or we watch over someone doing it, we have to be really in control of it especially if you're on mission, change the way the whole planet eats, which you are. And, and it is, if you're changing value systems, you are, you're, the sophistication of your control of the aesthetics, the aesthetics you're trying to dismantle and the aesthetics you're trying to recreate. And you know, I mean, the best example of this is look at how fascism used aesthetics. It's, you know, it's, it's incredible. It's, you know, one, it's, it's kind of, look at how Soviet communism used aesthetics to very quickly change a lot of people's minds about a lot of things. It's an aesthetic enterprise. And, and so 
as aesthetic engineers, which is kind of what architects are, we're value engineers, we have to be really in control of the aesthetics. So if I look at those images, tell me, do I see what you want me to see? Because I think I don't. I think stuff has got lost in translation. I see a kind of spooky airport, you know? And I see a lid of shininess that is telling me, if I lift the white shiny floor, there's a whole load of cow shit and rotten tomatoes <laughs> underneath or, or, or terminal pandemics, I don't know what. And I don't think that's what you're trying to communicate. So I, and you know, we, it's, you, you are at the end of your thesis project, you know, that representation is very difficult. I think we should be able to have, you should be able to partake in a sophisticated discussion about how we grapple with aesthetics and representation and what gets lost in translation, you know, and how we, how we, you know, what our communication tools are. Perhaps we need to completely rethink our communication tools. I, I would like to add one thing. In all your explanations, let's say, the starting hypo hypothesis was missing. For instance, already mentioned, the shrimps. It's a wonderful idea, but you have to mention that we can save the oceans by going to expensive shrimps. And it counts for all of you. It counts for the potatoes, counts for the apples, counts for the genetic manufactured food, etc. So you should first and foremost convey the paradigm shift you're advocating. None of you have done so. So hopefully in the next round, the five persons still to come will do that differently. Yeah, I was going to add that we haven't mentioned it, but it has been a really important part of the process. When we started thesis development, there were months in which each of us uh, researched about the reality of the products and ways of production we were dealing. I remember in the case of Georgia, uh, trying to defend that GMOs are good, uh, even if it has a really bad reputation, or in my case, uh, conducting many interviews to stream farmers in Indonesia that the first thing they, <laughs> sorry Ryan, they were telling me was all the reality about the working conditions. So even if it's it's not present like in the end of, of, of these videos now, uh, it's it has been part of the process and I was going to add to this that like my own reflection is uh, always a difficult, di difficulty uh, to be optimistic and realistic at the same time when you are like in the final phase of a product or of a of a project in which you need to be super optimistic but also taking into account this dark side or, or the reality of the production you are dealing with so i think it's a common problem that we all deal with like well, two things here first just to say Architecture is always inherently optimistic because it's speculation and projection. Am I on? Yeah, here, sorry. Architecture is always optimistic because it's speculative and projective. So that's just number one, don't forget that. But number two, I just want to talk about representation in your case, Anna, to make the link which is maybe not so clear. You started off with your uh, paella. Yes. Prepackaged paella with pink shrimp that you had in the fridge beyond an expiration date and they still remained pink and fresh looking and it was gross and it was disgusting. And that's where we get to the title, pink is not a <laughs> color, and to say that it's uh, 50 uh, shades of gray of what the shrimp really is. So I mean, that yeah. is an issue of representation. I'm just trying to make the link here still mm. didactically about where that comes into uh, as a kind of idea, the black in a facade of, uh, as a kind of uh, analogy to the kind of carcass or the crustacean, whatever this skin shell thing is called of the shrimp, right? I mean, it's all 
layered within this. So I think this is uh, just to put that as food for thought. Sorry, pun not intended. <laughs> um, we need to move on to uh, the next uh, session. It's 10 after. So the next session will start with the contribution of uh, uh, Jacqueline Mickey. Uh, Oat, can you get the video ready, titled Holy Berry? And I'll turn off the lights. The holy berry, originally named the pine berry, is a white berry expected to be tasteless from its color, is the food industry's new name for the unclassified word for the holy sweetness that shocks the senses. The 1,500 meter squared sensatorium and aftercare clinic for the six senses in Geel, Belgium, connects society to one's body and surroundings for a healing environment. 12 patients referencing the apostles of each of the five senses enter the sensatorium's main structure. For the loss of taste, a patient is surrounded by an atmosphere of the sweetness of the holy berry. Fresh spices and fruit for the tasting rooms and other four taste bud healing rooms for taste come from the blue banana. The patient will enter the palate cleansing rooms directly in between each of the healing rooms. The five courtyards in total are designed for a moment of pause from the day to day for society to experience the craving of experiences and stimulation from the pandemic for each of the senses. Three courtyards, sound, sight, and touch are located within the main structure of the sensatorium as a representation of the Holy Trinity. Two courtyards, smell and taste, are located within the previous farm's two courtyards on the monastery adjacent to the sensatorium within the city. Residents of Chael interact with patients within the courtyard to be a part of an inclusive environment needed after the pandemic. The patient can enter the courtyard of taste where the holy berry is grown during non-treatment within the adjacent monastery that historically treated mentally ill. With less than 500 patients a year for taste recovery, patients feel special to be surrounded by the holy berry which is growing during the abscission of most plants in October, representing the giver of life. The sixth sense, atmosphere, connects St. Dipnachrx. Patients can also use the public facilities, gyms, pools, and spas within the historically inclusive healthcare city of Gheel within their free time. In the evening, all 60 patients dine collectively within the sensatorium with an atmosphere to heighten the senses throughout the meal while having the feeling of comfort to be at one table among the 11 others throughout the journey. The sensorial meal is the last ritual of the healing process to break the feeling of isolation from the pandemic before they enter their normal daily routines. One holy berry is packaged carefully within a single container in the shape of a pyx that contains the lamb that is shaped for the hand as consumers are hungering for the divine fruit that comes from the mythological site. A breeding and tasting center of holy berries located 44 kilometers in Holstraten, Belgium, utilizes the heightened senses and demand of the sensatorium during the season of abscission as the last taste of life before winter. The ritual of the holy berry begins when each is handpicked under pink lights between 18 to 24 degrees Celsius next to their original bread strawberry. The hand-picked with gloves holy berry are priced higher than strawberries as consumers demand the taste of the holy site. The clear crates are trucked 85 kilometers to Albert in Delft, where they are brought up to the first floor by the Ocado system and stacked on top of each other, waiting to be brought down to the sales floor for restock. 
The clear the crates, crates highlight, highlight the purity, purity of white, white of the holy of the berries, berries on the sales floor among, among the standard, standard silver, silver crates, crates throughout, throughout Albert. Albert. The, holy the holy berry crate, crate is placed on top of a circular, circular table with high reflectivity that has a glowing effect to the consumer's eye that brings sensorial qualities for the consumer interactions amongst the standardization of Albert. Consumers can take the holy berry to their local parish and have it blessed by a priest or pastor on special occasions. Situated in the valley of River Meuse, Liège is a city with a maritime climate and the third most populous urban area in Belgium. Widely known as the former industrial backbone of Wallonia, part of the Ceylon Industrial, and a traditional urban trading node, Liège is still the economic and cultural center of the region. This contribution utilizes its strategic position in order to bring production back into and revitalize the city. Domus Leo is an urban winery that blends terroir fragments across the blue banana to produce high-end wine. Exploring protection regulations that can build upon the knowledge, tradition and novel techniques of winemaking, Domus Leo envisions a modified distribution network for wine. 17 hectares of Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and various youthful cross grapes from the Meuse Rhine Euro region form the base for Domus Leo's signature wine blends. After the harvest, that takes place between August and October, the hand-picked grape varieties, grown within a transnational cooperation of three different terroir zones, are transferred to the winery in Liège city centre. The contribution occupies a plot of 1,500 square metres in the middle of Montagne de Boeren, a 19th century grandiose staircase of 374 steps that not only serves as the entrance of the citadel, but is also a newfound pilgrimage route for wine enthusiasts. Domus Leo is not a chateau nor a domain. It is rather a domus, the urban equivalent of a winemaking estate. The winery consists of three buildings around a traditional townhouse, forming the new viticultural epicenter of the Meuse Rhine Euro region, the city corridor of Aachen, Maastricht, Liège. The word Leo reflects the emblem of all three cities, the lion. At the same time, Domus Leo brings a revolution to the European network of wine by importing an extra 200 tons of grapes per year from small vineyards all over Europe, according to each year's overproduction or climate. The imported grapes are transferred in containers via highways, railways and waterways. They go through a first stage, whole grape fermentation of semi-carbonic maceration in less than six weeks while on their way to Liège. The grapes are received from the Vatrum Terrace by a funicular cableway. The Vatrum, a 15 meter high, spacious linear building, houses the machinery for sorting and pressing. 35 vinification vats of various sizes and a bottling line, following the gravitational process of winemaking. There, during October and November, the grapes are vinified and blended with the Domus Leo signature base in order to mature within the urban setting. Domus Leo is organized around a circular blending hall connected to every level of the vinification process. The wine blends are produced by the master blender and owner of the winery through both organoleptic and scientific approaches. The winery launches signature, special and value for money blends of the year. Periodic events with master blenders from all over the world developing their own Domus Leo recipes bring in new and exotic ideas. After the blending process, the wine is stored and preserved to mature in huge oak barrels and stainless steel tanks. The wine cellar is an underground hall with dim lighting conditions. It is connected to a scarlet tower that captures sunlight through a dormer and brings it down to great depths. The cellar utilizes both gravity and technology to maintain the barrels and tanks at a constant temperature between 12 and 15 degrees Celsius and a humidity level between 80 and 90 percent. And premier barrels and tanks are available for sale. Domus Leo is capable of producing up, up to 300,000 liters of wine per year, namely 150,000 unique wine bottles. 
Between April and May, the glass bottles are filled, corked and labeled in the underground bottling station. Blending has always been a strategy to mediate climate shifts within the wine industry. A blend, always greater than the sum of its parts, has roots in wine knowledge and tradition. As the weather creates a new set of conditions that alters the way grapes ripen and make wine after its harvest, blend recipes are unique and can only be used once. The Domus Leo Eponymous Wine Bar offers a bar to bar blended experience. With uninterrupted use of the cellar, customers are challenged to create their own blends from the wine tanks hanging above the ceiling. The Wine Bar Terrace offers wine tasting and pairing. Corked wine bottles are stored in metal cases of 12, whereas barrels and tanks find their place in pallets, supplying the Albert supermarket chain, local restaurants, and private customers. Additional infrastructure, such as platforms on the river and a funicular cableway for transportation, connect the winery and its products to the waterways. Tomus Leo exports cases of its signature blends, barrels and wine tanks, specifically catering to the supermarket sales floor. The containers with the bottled cases, wine tanks and barrels arrive at the port of Rotterdam. In Mas Flacte, cranes unload the cargo boats. Domus Leo wine is then transferred from the future land to the rest of the world. The Domus Leo wine tanks reach their destination, the Albert supermarket on Martinus Nijhoflaan in Delft. Albert functions within a just-in-time production system, integrating an automated distribution center on the ceiling for deliveries across the Netherlands. The wine tanks are delivered in e-trucks to the dynamic loading dock located on the supermarket sales floor. Ocado robots lift the tanks with magnetic robotic arms and place them in the static grid ceiling above the sales floor that forms the distribution center. Tomus Leo offers a European blended experience in all Albert supermarkets inside the exclusive Tomus Leo shop in a shop. An independently curated circular volume floating in the open sales floor, located below the high yield core of the building, allows the tanks to be easily replaced by the Ocado robots. Albert showcases an innovative retail experience beyond the technology of the integrated distribution center, extending its perimeter toward the city of Delft to establish a new civic presence. The Domus Leo shopping shop is strategically located in the designated slow pace zone along the building's periphery and next to a public green area, filled with product demonstrations, workshops and exclusive shops that entice consumers into the supermarket. Domus Leo offers a novel tasting experience, challenging the consumer to create unique wine blends from different countries with the guidance of a resident sommelier. The consumer can choose the taste profile, flavors and provenance preference in order to create a custom-made wine blend. Digital signage on the bulk shelves of the wine tanks showcase the provenance of its wine. The non-disposable metal container is only purchased once and can be refilled afterwards. Cheers! At 88 million tons, food waste alone can feed four times the number of those that are food insecure in the EU. By leveraging past and future infrastructure networks, can the European Utility Network for Food be established? Ugly produce gets separated into food waste before supermarket-ready products, but standardized pricing continues through the supply chain. Existing food donations initiatives can be supported by the network to reharvest and redistribute food waste. However, to extend beyond charity and normalize free food for all citizens, other sources are needed that can come directly from the farmer. In some cases, a good harvest can affect farmers negatively as excess yields impact global supplies, causing prices to plummet. In other cases, an imbalance in agricultural subsidies causes distortion from the market for production. In extreme cases, the pandemic creates a drastic shift in market demand and labor availability. 10,000 kilograms of rotting onions in trenches on a farm, 3 million liters of milk poured out on the streets, 1.5 million tons of potatoes in storage are not on common sites. 
The Food Utility Network can provide a place for all this produce ready for market to go when the market is not ready. The first plant in Genoa, Italy, utilizes its strategic position at the southern end of the Rhine Alpine Transportation Corridor and the development of the Port of Genoa as a major import terminal to accept food donations for redistribution. Additionally, the Genoese culinary history and Made in Italy label, now a Made by Italy label, brings a sense of quality to the complementary products. The network repurposes a gasometer from the coal-based gas wells utility projects that were commonly sited in forest near parts of European cities. Revitalizing the industrial relic and maintaining its function as a buffer for the utility to a new utility with more environmental awareness. The fresh produce being donated can be irregular in every way from composition to shape, requiring a food processing plant different from standards in the food utility, where manufacturing lines are designed for regularity. Modeled after an industrial kitchen, the plant brings chefs with the flexibility in processing and thinking required to handle the income donations that manufacturing lines cannot offer back into the daylight factory. Utilizing a culinary history along with industrial tools, the fresh produce gathered at the plant is preserved into nutritious and delicious products. Some products, like banana powder, can be processed with even just one type of produce. Others become possibilities in concert with other items in the current and expected inventory conveyed by the logistics crew. In either case, the first step is preparation by washing, cutting, and organizing the produce. Many preservation techniques can be finished within the day or overnight. A product for babies and adults, banana powder is produced by smashing the bananas into a pulp, followed by a dehydration process to make a dry bulk product. Pickling, canning, jamming, confiting, pasteurizing, and dehydrating can be done within a typical kitchen. Other techniques require dedicated time and spaces, such as fermenting and curing in climate-controlled rooms over multiple days. Salt, sugar, acids, oils, and alcohols are commonly used in these preservation methods, with many aligned for different combinations. However, reusable jars are the final container for all products, whether wet or dry, sealed or not. On the other side of Europe, in the control room of the Faro Dome, Silo, and Rotterdam, Netherlands, a supply chain manager and nutritionist work together to source food from multiple plants throughout the network. Organized by the logistics of the control room, products from plants are redistributed out of the silo to mitigate the creation of food deserts. The redistribution occurs through multiple channels to reach all parts of Europe, from industrial ports and university towns, urban metropolises to rural villages. When possible, building up of existing non-profit and community-organized efforts, the food works truck services, community pantries, ensuring the availability of food at all times. Food desert regions without supermarkets prioritize for the redistribution to supplement the offerings at the local convenience store, bodega, or gas station, bringing more options and customers to these small businesses. Redistributing to supermarkets is a simpler process logistically, as the food works can pass the products off to have them manage the distribution and stocking. Within the supermarket, the container deposit system is extended upon for the jars that are used to hold all products. Although free, Products are still labeled with barcodes to keep track of the inventory and charge for the jars. The publicly owned products are placed along the storefront by other high-end products, letting those passing by know that these handmade products are available here. Cereals and dried goods are sold in bulk where standardized containers are used. Items produced from food waste like light banana powder become staples as its supply can be more constant. Other items donated as surplus, however, are more variable in quantity and is reflected in their availability. The free products act as loss leaders in the grocery store, bringing customers to make additional purchases. However, this alone is not incentive enough for the supermarkets to offer their food waste, distribution network, and sales force. Tax incentives like those including the Gata Law that were aimed at reducing food waste at all levels in Italy are needed. For a typical resident of Genoa, these changes may have just meant the appearance of beautiful family bags to take home food from restaurants in an effort to shift perceptions on consuming waste. Although for the food industry, tax breaks based on amounts of food donated, promoting collaborations with food banks. These collaborations will continue for businesses like caterers and schools at the food service level, while the network will collaborate with food producers and distributors. This requires a simplification of the donation process for food waste. For a small-scale small potato, potato farmer in the Netherlands, Netherlands, different initiatives for donations of food surplus can be incorporated. Currently, 41 billion euros is given out as direct single farm payments, subsidizing the land of farmers. 
85% of it currently goes to farms larger than 12 hectares, which only represents a quarter of farmers. Tax credits for donations from farmers relying on their variable harvests can ensure financial security for them, but also food security for Europe. In the central financial district of Frankfurt, an automat restaurant aimed to provide a new dining experience to locals through automation technology and modern cooking techniques. The automat can provide freshly made, high-quality cuisine that fits within the busy lunch hour of Frankfurt financial hotshots, just three kilometers outside the city center. Press forwards invite visitors to dine in and see an innovative culinary production process. The complex feature fully automated culinary facilities from production to the dining room space. Each and every menu is created by a team of culinary artists at Fresh Forward Style Kitchen Facility. They employ modern cooking techniques to help us enjoy food in new ways. With the help of automation, the cooking process of these newly created dishes are replicated by the automated cooking station. Therefore, chefs can focus on creating and perfecting their dishes. The raw ingredients are stored in a 15 by 15 cm silicon vacuum sealed bag and are sous fit cooked to perfection before being stored in the freezer. This method also provides a longer shelf life for the ingredients. Utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning technology, raw ingredients are automatically ordered from local suppliers in Frankfurt and delivered by a driverless ETRA. The magnetic robot claw bring all the pallets through the ETRA roof and place them into a storage area along the building perimeters. Inside the shorting and storage facility, a team of chefs conduct quality control on the new supply of raw ingredients. The chef engineers ensure every ingredient is up to fresh forward standard of hygiene and quality. Our ingredients in Fresh Forward are mainly cultured meat and plant-based ingredients in order to maintain similar size and quality. The ingredients are packed inside a vacuum sealed bag with the seasonings and garnish. These bags are pre-cooked via sous technique at a specific temperature. Then bags are put into an ice bath and stored in a freezer. At the entrance, customers catch a glimpse of a raw ingredients being processed. A wall of glass cabinet filled with the vacuum sealed ingredients that are ready to be cooked and served surrounding the cooking machine. The automated kitchen area can be seen from the dining hall. The cooking tools are designed to be efficiently cook several ingredients at the same time. This machine can infuse extracted broth or juice from the ingredients to intensify flavors. Visitors can watch their food being cooked and transported to the shelf above the automat locker. The kitchen space aesthetically showcases the special and visual uniformity and repetition that is required for the automat machines to work efficiently. The kitchen exhibits the rhythmic flow of ingredients through the space, creating an eye-pleasing and eye-catching spectacle. Once diner place their orders, the appropriate to fit vacuum bag are read inside the cooking machine. Their contents cook. Meals are delivered through pickup points, which are scattered in the fresh forward dining hall. Vertical spatial connection between the automated kitchen and the dining space give flexibility in the spatial organization of the sales floor, further enhancing the dining experience. Dishes are served in the slick food trays. Visitors can enjoy their food in the indoors or outdoor dining halls around the restaurant complex. The packaging design provides a convenient way for diners to easily consume their meals without any utensils. To reduce food waste, pre-cooked ingredients near expiration will be cooked, flash frozen, and packed into ready-to-heat frozen food. They are then distributed to regional supermarkets, such as Rewe in Germany or Albert in the Netherlands, in order to strategically expand fresh forward service territory. 
This ready to heat frozen foods and pre-cooked packing bags are also sold at the frozen food shelf of the Fresh Forward complex. This shelf will be the prototype of how Fresh Forward's product can fit inside the supermarket. Fresh Forward goods are easily loaded and transported to partners due to their packaging modularity. 180 by 80 by 180 cm pallet can contain 360 frozen food packages or 1,440 vacuum sealed ingredients. Eventually, fresh forward pre-cooked ingredients and frozen foods will arrive at the Albert at Martinez Nyhoff Line within the city of Dell. Packaging from fresh forwards fits with the dimension of grids inside the Ocado grid system of Albert, therefore optimizing unloading and storage processes. All the frozen food packages and pre-cooked vacuum bags will be stored on cold shelf inside the Ocado grid storage system. When meals are ordered, pre-cooked packages will be transported to the mini automated kitchen inside Albert. When food is cooked and ready to serve, the Ocado boat will serve the food directly to the consumer table. Inside the automat, the loading of meals and frozen food into the shelf is visible to the visitor through the Ocado grid system. The cooking machine can imitate master chef in preparing and cooking mouth-watering artisanal creations. From Albert online application, customers in Netherlands can access fresh forward's ordering system to place and pick up their orders. They have the option to pick up at the Albert store or get their food delivered via Albert instant delivery service. The customer will receive a QR code to pick up their orders from automatic pickup point. The customers of Albert can order their food while doing their grocery shopping. Fresh Forward is presented in the Albert store as a complement to the supermarket experience. Visitors can enjoy affordable, high-quality, artisanal cuisine made by a celebrated chef in their local supermarket. There are three options of Fresh Forward goods available in the Albert Martinus Nyhoffland store. Customers can directly take out fresh words frozen goods from the refrigerated area while they need to wait 3 to 5 minutes for freshly cooked meal to be prepared. Finally, similar to the fresh forward facilities in Frankfurt, the customers can enjoy their meals in their preferred environment settings around an Albert Civic space. Now, the freshly cooked high quality cuisine invented by Master Chef in Frankfurt are available to be enjoyed in the Albert Garden, hundreds of kilometers away. With cacao growing extinct by 2030 to be unreservedly replaced by already prevalent profitable substitutes on supermarket shelves like some With cacao growing extinct by 2030 to be unreservedly replaced by already prevalent profitable substitutes on No, you can be the cow.
No, I'm sorry. This is not picking up either from the computer. So can what I shall I do, Nishi? Yeah, I can narrate it. Yeah. Can we start again, please? Sorry. And can you turn off the audio? With cacao going extinct by 2030 to be unreservedly replaced by already prevalent profitable substitutes on supermarket shelves like soy and hazelnut, real chocolate is now scarce and inherently luxurious. Willing to expand into the sector of craft chocolate, of Hermes, a family-owned French brand recognized for its luxury crafted goods, envisions the need for luxury chocolate to save the craft of chocolate making. The surviving cacao plantations use the resources provided by Hermes to conduct research and scientific developments. Now home to local chocolateries in Switzerland, Belgium, and Paris, Hermes provides the resources to market its products through carefully selected channels. Creating a communal culture of luxury craft chocolate modifies the supply chain and allows local exports to introduce a new distribution network of real chocolate. With consumers seeking higher quality chocolate, the market prospects in Europe still provide good opportunities for exporters in producing countries. Switzerland, the largest chocolate exporter and the highest chocolate consumer, utilizes its ad added advantage of the free trade agreement with the European Union. The medieval town of Gruyers in Switzerland occupies a small land area at the hilltop of an 82 meter high. Gruyers, a rural town with milk production and cattle breeding as its primary sector, provides proximity to regional products such as Friburg milk, Morello cherries, Swiss Kirsch, and Swiss cane beets. For the infamous Gruyers cheese and Swiss chocolate, designating it as a popular tourist destination. The car-free French-speaking village of Gruyers, offering beautiful views of the Alps, is centered around its main road. With cobbled walkways and quarried stone fort walls, the historic village identifies itself through its distinct architectural fabric. The existing chocolatery, Chocolatry de Gruyers, was built as an extension to the fort wall of the village, a heritage site of national significance. A small family business, the chocolatery specializes in small batch bean-to-bar craft chocolate and is now housed by Hermes, providing complete traceability of chocolate's provenance from the cacao bean to the chocolate bar. The engagement with Hermes requires a new development of the chocolatery to express the luxury and craft of chocolate making under the new branding. Crafted wooden screens and roof shingles inspired from the Swiss chalet style replace the original facade to create an enticing and illuminated storefront. The chocolatery, committed to the tenets of traceability, is redesigned to additionally function as a gallery, educating the visitors on the transparency of chocolate processing and the value of craft production through the impl implicit connection with the maker. Through the disintegration of chocolate production into its layers of programmatic elements, the chocolatery highlights the precision at each level of chocolate making, from sorting and roasting cacao beans to packaging chocolate bars. The integration of the new intervention with the existing fortification provides different transitional routes. For varying consumer flux, tourists and exclusive buyers, while creating visual and transitional vistas overlooking the chocolate production. Heritage monuments, limited in numbers, become the natural site for the branded chocolatery, nurturing its rich history and craft, while providing vintage charm, spacious premises, and a parallel exclusivity that complements product identity. The beans are sourced from three different provenances of the surviving cacao trees, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Brazil. Packaged in the iconic Hermes box with a specially designed silk scarf, the chocolates reflect brand identity, the inherent luxury, and craft preservation. Fetching the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage listing, the site in the car-free village has proximity to parking areas, 
is located at a distance of 800 meters from the railway station and a distance of 90 meters from the bus stop, providing excellent connectivity for the transport of these chocolates into the major Swiss trade routes of Europe. Taking advantage of the resources of Hermes, these Swiss delicacies cross their territories across the blue banana, reaching the integrated distribution center of Albert at Martinus Nehoflan in Delft to be displayed on the sales floor of the supermarket. The limited selection of Hermes luxurious crafted and real chocolates <laughs> caters to a target demography with its artisanal opulence challenging the notion of experience in retail with a peripheral shop in a shop. The concept of shop in a shop with Albert's sister shops and local companies provides varied experiences, enticing passers-by, while boosting the appeal of brands, creating a more comfortable shopping experience and introducing new and exclusive products. The interior with a sparing display of 30 chocolate boxes worth 250 euros each accentuates the brand's exclusivity. A small corner for chocolate tasting allows the consumers at Albert to experience milk and dark chocolates, crafted from a small village in Switzerland. With a decline in discretionary spending, the demand for craft production surges, sustained by the new wave of conscious consumers willing to invest in artisanal luxuries that reflect superior quality, traceability, and uniqueness. I'll turn the lights back on and we can open the discussion again for uh, this round of videos. So this was the second set of the, the special narratives. Um, going a little bit further than the Netherlands. So we started in Belgium and then ended in uh, Switzerland. Um, and we would like to open up the floor for any questions. Thanks. Um, thank you um, also for the last five presentations. Um, maybe it's just maybe I'm a bit confused and maybe you can help me there. So. It also ties into the first question that was asked uh, today. Um, when I see the product, uh, the, the videos, and then the maps here in front of us, I'm wondering um, which kind of the, your, what your client is. Because in a way, when I saw the video, the first video this morning, I thought it was kind of ironic. But then I got confused because it was kind of talked about like reality. And then some of the projects are actually very subtle or turn into something very subtle and inter interesting but start off kind of almost ironic. And so I'm kind of confused what kind of, how I have to read the material you're, pre you're presenting to me in a way. Um, hi. The intentions with the presentations were actually derived from the um, spatial narratives that we have produced and which you already saw in the uh, exhibition space. So the idea for these um, spatial narratives was to show how each of our products are coming from the place of production till the supermarket. So even though um, we don't directly or necessarily start with the product itself, the intention is always what's happening with the product and how is it going to the supermarket, whereas the drawing sets are purely talking about the architecture of our contribution that is located um, in that region. But, but to who are the videos directed? My own? To, to who do you direct the videos? Do you, do you direct them to us, the architectural critics in a way? Or do you direct them to the Albert Hein or Albert, right? N Is this kind of the way you want to sell your product to them? Well, actually in the background you have kind of a second agenda, right? Well, th the videos are, yes, are not arch pure architecture rep representation. I mean, uh, it's more of uh, a way to describe, let's say, the, uh, the contribution and uh, the, what it proposes, but I, uh, not to an architectural audience, if that's what you mean. Hmm? 
not mandatory. I mean, in a way that it also, when one is not an architect, he cannot easily read a drawing set, or he could read it, but he needs something more. So this is a kind of a... Um, I can help with uh, to add some. So uh, the, we hope for this uh, special narrative is to uh, for our collective audience. So this special narrative is to connect our individual pro uh, contribution to the collective project, which is uh, the supermarket itself. So we hope uh, by uh, watching this video, uh, the audience can know like how this individual contribution connect together into one uh, supermarket. So, so that's how I, I we... I think that's clear. That's abundantly yeah. clear that, that you're trying to join all of these micro-narratives or micro-logics up through the videos. Ilmar's question is, is who is the audience? It, because part of being in control of representation is using different representational registers for different audiences, different stakeholders. And... I guess we're slightly puzzled as to why, as architects, we're watching the videos. Unless you are presenting, I certainly am, unless you are saying, these are the videos that we would show to the marketing people working for the supermarket company, or these are the videos that we would show to shoppers who are kind of browsing on Instagram, different kind of platforms that they might be happy to shop on. So in a sense, who, who is the target video? And I, I mean, let's, let's just let you answer that. And then I want to say something really positive because I'm feeling I'm just sitting here being <laughs> negative. Um, I would say the, ne like these videos are done kind of in a more like cartoon style for most drawings. And it's more for the public kind of atmosphere to kind of get a general sense of tracing the product from the origin to the shelf, whereas it's more, the drawing sets are more directed to architects and kind of the clients or the people they're specifically designed for, and that's why the drawing technique style is different either through the representation in the exhibition. So this is more kind of, um, I'm if you already work at Albert, you, you, they already have this kind of history, right? So it's kind of this more idea of, tracing each step of the product to make it a clear delineation kind of to the, as a general kind of knowledge. I think that answers it more. It's more directed not towards an architectural audience. It's just to get the specific spaces that it's going through quickly. Maybe, agree. maybe I can answer in terms of why this representation and who the audience. So the uh, um, purpose of this for us uh, in the first uh, place was to understand what is our product. So, for example, for Maria, why she has this bottle, this uh, type of material, because she knows that her product should be eventually in the supermarket. And it's very difficult to understand all implications that come to the product while it's going through the supply chain. So for us, it was the exercise. And I believe it's still for the architectural audience to understand all this small very important details that will relate to the product and eventually influence on the architecture. So it's, as a narrative, I, I believe it works for more broad uh, audience than architects, but for us, it was very important part to understand in the end our building type. But, but then I, I still let's think all, that Sorry, can I add up to that also? And that's why, I mean, the, let's say, the framing of this was a spatial narrative. So, of course, it has to do with architecture. Of, of course, it addresses the architectural audience, but in a, it takes also the form of a narrative. But then it, it is kind of a mixed kind of analysis and proposal in a certain way, or this is how we read it. It's still not very clear, kind of this first question, whether your project is dystopian or utopian. Because some of it, uh, uh, of this future you're proposing, kind of horrifies me, literally, right? And, and some of it is extremely interesting. And, and then I'm kind of confused if you also, you know, propose this, this kind of future, or if, you, if that was the critique part of the proposal. I'm gonna say something nice now. Because I'm really quite nice. Um, it, I mean, I, we can agree that 
all good utopias are under the lid dystopic, yeah? That the two are folded together. I, th I think that there are, the more you unpack it, the more I enjoy the project, that there are, and then the more I dig in for this, the more I enjoy the project. There are kind of numerous corners where you've gone off into putting free food next to Hermes in the supermarket or looking at kind of excessive yield waste. And I thought the utility one was great. Um, or what else were you doing? Um, in the, uh, there's too many bits to this project. Um, in a sense, starting to kind of, at the beginning of this, it says reconstructing the supermarket. One could, you know, ideally, if you, if you push the project out further and you took more risk, deconstructing the supermarket is actually starting to dismantle the supermarket, dismantle the neoliberal supermarket. And, and in a sense, that's where it's that kind of fragmentized and slightly funky project that is suggested in these earlier models that you did, I understand, um, in here, which, which kind of fold, they're kind of humorous and um, there's a kind of hilarious mixing of not very shiny looking tomatoes with robots. And there, that, that's, for me, that's where you're really starting to get somewhere. The problem is over here, we've got shiny tomatoes with shiny robots in a shiny environment, and it's all shiny, and you just can't see the shininess for the shininess. And, and it's that tension between the shiny robot somehow standing for the neoliberal as yet unhijacked by alternative agendas. And the ugly tomato or the misshapen carrot or you know the kind of funny, funky plant that's part genetically modified and now at the wrong latitude, that's where it starts to get really interesting. And it's, it's really important that in future work, you really keep control of the representation. Because the more you elaborate in your stories, I think actually this is what they were talking about, not that, you know. And, and you really make sure that, reps, that kind of the render, the shiny render for one, or I mean not necessarily shiny renders have their place, but make sure that the, the drawing or the choice of representation register doesn't become the tail that wags the dog. It's okay. Oh, I mean, I will take some responsibility for these spatial narratives as a didactic tool. Just, I think it's important to um, uh, talk about where those began to, in order to understand where they ended up. Um, so as you can imagine, in trying to form a collective project with uh, 10 individual voices, stubbornnesses, interests, uh, people who didn't know what their interests were, uh, didn't know how to connect what they were doing as some kind of form of uh, research or what we call thesis development. The idea here was to basically start, uh, there, were a, there were a few parameters. It was to basically start from the product um, and then to end up, uh, and to end up basically at first in the Delft Distribution Center. So that was, let's say, the first version of this, these spatial scenarios as a way to get from wherever their locations were, their individual locations, to the Delft Distribution Center. And then as the collective project uh, progressed, there was no longer a distribution center, right? And so uh, there became the parameter of just maintaining the same number of frames. Uh, and then how do you tell the story to get then back from the distribution center to the development of the individual contribution back to the Albert, which is where they ended up, right? So this um, I don't agree that it's a kind of cartoon representation, even though it appears that way. It, it is not a comic. It is not a Jimenez lie, if you know that kind of work. It is there as a kind of way to start, or it was there with an intentionality to, to start to spatialize uh, uh, a set of ideas and to start to draw um, 
architecture at first when you don't know where to start. So, you know, if you want to talk, let's say there is, uh, this isn't really true, but I'll just use it as an exemplar. If you're interested in the consumer and the concierge and the uh, info desk, you basically start to draw that to understand how you compose architecture. So from that kind of scene, because everybody has an imagination about scenes, but maybe nobody knows where to begin to design a project, or how do you begin to design a GMO laboratory without falling into the cliche of a laboratory, right? So, I mean, so in that sense, there's a kind of, there is a kind of perversion now to use something as a kind of film presentation and as a um, didactic tool, but it's, you know, but it's this kind of calibration and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't work, but it's an experiment. So that's what we're here to do as, as an experiment. So just to kind of place that uh, into context, the, um, all your guests left. What's, what's up with your, your partners left here in this moment? Um, sorry. I don't, there's another question. I, I completely um, agree, agree that the kind of the role of the scenographic has been very important in terms of communicating the project, and that works. What is what would have enhanced the films is for them not to be homogeneity, less, less homogeneity between them. They all have a white background. They all have sparse use of black line. They all draw a flattened space, don't they? And yet some are talking about chocolate production in Switzerland, some are talking about food waste in restaurants and changes to you know, tax systems in Italy and so on. And so in a sense, had they all been done differently, might that have better represented the ultimate heterogeneity of the proposal? You know, because in a sense, you talk about the kind of civic deconstructing. I'm going to call it deconstructing the supermarket. No, okay, let's say with reconstructing the supermarket. Um, reconstructing the supermarket and, and lending it a civic role and in flipping the floor to the ceiling, uh, incorporating some kind of um, dioramas of production within it, uh, making it somehow porous to the city. All of these things, I mean, Surely, it would have to be incredibly heterogeneous in its makeup, in its different languages, in its different modes of communication. You've got trucks coming through, potentially a cow will walk in one day. You've got ugly fruit next to perfect shiny fruit. You know, it seems to me it, is, it needs to be a city within itself. So I guess the question is, then, why do all the films look the same? Why do all the surfaces and the renders look the same? Why are you all sitting on same chairs? You know? Why are the portfolios all the same? Because you're designing as a crowd, for a crowd, for ultimately the ultimate typology that kind of could, if we make it more radical, become the crowd typology. The crowd where you have the micro farmer, the luxury good, the soup kitchen free food, the waste food, the boutique recipe, you know, the screaming kid, you know, all, all these things together. So I don't, I think there's something, and there's some of the kind of, the edginess that for me is latent in the project that that would suggest that is in some of the bits of representation that are buried in the booklet and that aren't out here. Now, ultimately the conversation one would want to be having, or I'm trying to get going, at this point in the day on your thesis project is about how difficult representation is and how, as architects, we don't make buildings. We mediate through representation. And representation includes the specifications that you write and you send to the rendering company in Indonesia or wherever it was. You know, we have to, everything we do goes through that bottleneck. So how do we do it? How do we do it better? You know, how do we, how do we do it? Um, so, personally, while developing the supermarket, I think there was uh, the technology, 
that's inherently part of the future um, heavily influenced, I think, all me definitely, but I think all of us a lot in the way that we envisioned it. This grid system that the robots need to always work with in a perfect square. They're all hyper standardized. They move very organized. Um, yeah, and maybe that contributed a bit to the, also a little subconsciously in the way that we envisioned it. Because um, within this grid, which is extremely dominant conceptually and physically within our project, outside of it is more heterogeneous, right? Um, but within that grid, which is the core of the supermarket where you really are going daily to buy things, it's under this really rigid system so that it can um, get food to people most efficiently as possible. Um, hopefully that also reduces price, even if it looks very expensive. Um, there is a, I guess, positive to this kind of in intense um, standardization, right? Me, the, the beautiful moment of the project is the robot meeting the ugly carrot. Yeah? yeah the imperfect by, carrot. Ugly, by ugly food. By, I mean, ugly. Australian supermarkets have a large section called ugly food. And there you go, you buy the misshapen carrots and so on. Yeah. So it's, it's the point where the, the paradigm that requires ultra ultra predictability ultra standardization meets the paradigm that is actually all about unpredictability in the material world yeah may, maybe just on, on this robotics i think it's interesting because the way robotics are evolving at the moment is actually that they don't need standardization anymore so if you talk about robotics um, for the coming 10 years maybe yes but after that there's actually no need for standardization and robots are actually very capable of operating in a very dynamic environment, which actually they don't know even in advance. So also there, I think there could be also another exploration where robots really start to inter be integrated in human uh, spaces, right? Spaces made for human uh, that are then inhabited by robots, yes, but not necessarily the other way around. I was just thinking of a point that Francesca made here, uh, flipping through the collective dossier about that the conceptual models uh, from November uh, were stronger than the final renderings. So this is, let's say, what she says. I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I do in function of uh, distilling an idea, but I think for me, it was also interesting to have the materials outsourced and resolved and modeled to actually see what you get. Because this kind of, this kind of, as photographs of models, they are a, a kind of concept, but maybe this kind of, I don't wanna say in, indifference or ambiguity between utopia and dystopia, it becomes evident through the act of outsourcing. So, or the, the act of, um, through the act of giving instructions about what decisions were made, not made, uh, the decisions of giving something over to the outsources, communicating back and forth, the critiques that you guys gave to it to develop it. So I do think that it's really interesting um, because maybe this sounds, maybe the comments, I, I think you should not misinterpret these comments as negative, is what I'm trying to say is they provoke a set of questions that are very interesting for uh, contemporary practice and the realities of that without ever having to be a kind of fuddy-duddy uh, practitioner about it, you know? So it basically brings a kind of intellectualism, I hope, to the everyday of contemporary practice and what people have to deal with. And how Michiel commissions his 15,000 euros, you know, for that one image to win that competition, you know? So I think that that is how to be a, you know, a reflexive practitioner, how to be one step within reality and outside of reality, et cetera. Okay. Um, I agree that, of course, this, the, there is on one level the, the image sheet 
it produces and how tailored that is. But I think the first commentary of Francesca about, um, let's say, the 1950s effect we had also content to it. It was, uh, you know, what is something, what's hidden behind a kind of, uh, a certain kind of atmosphere. So I think, I think it's not just how the, what, what image it produces in the renderings, but also the combination of elements. There is something, in a sense, it's a, it's a kind of space framey, endless space that, just happens to be inhabited now by something. So th that kind of um, space already existed. It's a kind of, you know, archigram or what, what's it? No, uh, what's it called? Uh, archizoom or uh, archizoom into the, exactly. Um, a, a little bit also this idea because of the mixing, the fact that you in the supermarket all of a sudden other things are happening. It's it becomes this kind of almost van Klingere idea. The, the fact that we just need endless, the kind of space we're sitting in, for God's sake, right? This kind of idea that uh, a courtyard can be some something, you know, everything's supposed to happen. So I think there is, before how the, Im the idea is communicated, is also an idea of a kind of space. And yet this, this has to do, I think, with something... Uh, if this is really a forum, it was called, no? It's, um, there is something about it that makes sense, you know? We, that the, the center, which clearly is important in our logistics and our networks and our food production, that in the end, there is a, a place where you become conscious of the consumption, and that that one looks like, you know, looks like an art gallery or a museum, uh, instead of investing in art galleries and museums, I mean, I'm going to be really um, killed for this. You know, the, 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 the architects, our temples, you know, are the cultural temples, and that's, that's the temples we build. But instead, you're kind of using the, the energy and, and the, the role in the urban fabric for this sort of the, for the, the, the temple of the consumption. So I think that is, at least it makes one thing, I would say, beyond the whatever you can say uh, about the image. And then in relationship to the, the different projects, I think it raised uh, uh, different issues, obviously, but just one I think which is interesting is, you know, in the spectrum that's suggested between, I don't know, rural blight or this kind of, uh, the, you know, the, the questions also, also economically, how an economy on the production side uh, sustains itself. Uh, between that and um, the kind of chocolate uh, the, the refined uh, village, you know, in that spectrum, you know, is it is it a kind of either or world? So what's gonna what saves? You know, what does it need to be saved? The countryside, right? It's been there for a really long time. The countryside. So do, do we need to save it? Uh, do we need the corporate world to save it? Um, and I, th I think th th there is a, I mean, there is also other, you know, I think also, uh, uh, Michael, your project raised on the production side this thing, no? You know, the, it's probably already happening, right? So, and um, what does it mean economically on the production side beyond the kind of expendable income question on the consumption side, which uh, Michio raised in the beginning. Those, is, those are two very different sides, but it's, I think it's still the same economy. You know, there's supposed to be like one economy, and that is different. <laughs> Not yet. Thank you very much, Philippe. I, I would like to add one more thing to um, Philippe's uh, statement. And which is um, mainly an observation. And it has to do with um, whether architecture can have an agenda. So let's say basically a century ago, we as a professional group thought that architecture could have an agenda. 
which was internationalists, which might have been emancipatory, which might have been, let's say, focused towards equality, lifting poverty, and other agendas that were formulated in the 20s. And since the Second World War, the 50s and the 60s, we went through a series of ideological crises, so to speak. And what is really interesting, and which is maybe the meta question which hovers above the table and which might also be, be hovering above all our comments, is whether architecture can have an agenda facing the climate crisis, facing the inequality, the appalling poverty globally, and let's say other questions we have to address. And the interesting thing that, that became aware to me while, while listening to the others in, in, in the jury is that you're struggling with this dilemma whether architecture can have an agenda, and at the same time, you are addressing it because it's the task of your ge generation addressing these questions, addressing the inequality, addressing the climate crisis, hence trying to formulate or re-establish an agenda for architecture. And I thought that was really beautiful and well done, and I will wish you a lot of success with that in the coming decades. Thank you very much. Nisi, closing words. I think it was a really nice closing remark. Then Nisi. <laughs> no, just thank you for such a wonderful last event for us and with your insightful comments and I guess congratulations to all of us.